everyone and uh, uh, we of course welcome uh, Senator Kiko once again who's patiently joined us time and again. Maraming salamat at yung iba pang mga colleagues natin who have sent representatives. So um, we have uh, this public hearing, May 19. This is actually uh, what is now our third hearing on the same resolution regarding hard hit uh, industries in the country, those hard hit by the pandemic of which we have too many indeed. So um, basically we've had the longest, arguably the most expensive and uh, draconian lockdown in the world. And yet we have been condemned by the World Bank, the ABB, the IMF as being the laggard in recovery in Southeast Asia. Why is this so and what can we do um, on the part of government uh, to assuage these problems? So, isa isa natin tinatawagan yung iba't ibang industriya at uh, narinig na natin yung uh, iba na nasa um, manufacturing sector, yung export group natin, pagkatapos uh, narinig na rin natin yung iba na nasa TODA at uh, transport sector, pati yung nasa construction industry. So, tapos na sila. Pero today, iba na naman and... Uh, I thank um, the Philippine uh, Hospital Association naka dalawa tatlong beses na kayong pagbalik-balik hindi kayo natatawag sa pagkat uh, napakahaba ng ating mga hearing. So uh, uh, with that I'd uh, like uh, to discuss and uh, launch into uh, what can government do for you and at the same time what have we done? What has actually worked and uh, what programs need uh, improvement or should actually be replaced? Para me monitoring and assessment and for the purposes of planning forward. So, um, as uh, Senator Kiko knows, we're going to be reopening in July for uh, the budget hearings for 2022. And all of this will be critical information when we determine how we are going to spend the funds that we have. Okay, so committee secretary, kung pwede, tawagan na natin ang ating mga resource speaker. Good morning, Senator Aimee Marcos. Good morning, Senator Kiko Pangilinan. And to our distinguished guests, for today's hearing, we have from the hospitals, the Philippine Hospital Association, Dr. Jaime A. Almora is president. From the Philippine Nurses Association, we have Governor Melbert B. Reyes, their national president. From the Hotels and Restaurants, Hotel and Restaurant Association of the Philippines, uh, they are represented by their vice president, Mr. Bobby Horigan, who is also the general manager of Acacia Hotels. Uh, he is accompanied with Ms. Cynthia Diocares, their finance and admin manager, and Ms. Mercy Manikis. From the Lechu Property Consultants Incorporated, Mr. David uh, This is Lechu. another industry. This is real estate, right? And yes, po. Real estate po ito. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lechu is the Chief Executive Officer. From the agriculture sector, we have from the Philippine Native Pig Owners Network Association. Uh, they are represented by their chairman, Mr. Maximilian Ian Cabriga. From the Federation of Cattle Racers Association of the Philippines, President Martin Gomez. From the Samahang Industria ng Agricultura or SINAG, they are represented by Engineer Rosendo So, their president. From Nagkaisang Magsasaka ng Isabela Agriculture Cooperative, uh, they are represented by their chairman, Ms. Anna Go. From the, from the Philippine Maize Federation, Inc., uh, they are represented by their chairperson, Engineer Roger Navarro. From the Grains Retailers, uh, they are represented by Mr. Joseph S. Gotero. And from the Coconut Industry Reform, Mr., uh, their advisor is Mr. Jose Marie T. Faustino. From the Alliance of the Philippine Fishing Federations, uh, Senator, nagpadala din to ng comments. They are represented by Attorney Herschel Magracia. The haulers and truck sector. Thank you very uh, much for the position paper. I mean receipt, sorry. 
pa. The Haulers and Trucks Association Sector from the Inland Haulers and Tractors Association. They are represented by President Ted S. Hervasio. From the Confederation of Trackers Association of the Philippines or CTAP, they are represented by President Mary Zapata with Mr. Pepito Dino. Yes, thank you very much. They also gave us a position paper as well as several summaries. Yes, po. From the Hatao Trackers Association, they are represented by their legal counsel, Attorney Ferdinand Maniebo. From the Coalition of Track Operators Association of Bulacan, they are represented by Mr. John Magtalas. From the shipping industry, uh, the Magsaysay Shipping and Logistics, they are represented by Attorney Peter Aguilar, their Executive Director, and the Philippine Inter-Island Shipping Association. And Mr. Mark Mateo Parco, the President of the Philippine Liner Shipping Association. That's all, Senator. Yes, so um, I am to understand that the e-delivery services will be reserved for... Uh, the new normal way forward, et cetera. Is that correct, uh, Comsec? Yes, Pop. Okay, so we stay with that. So, Nasa Services Muna Tayo. Thank you very much. And without further ado, we call on uh, Philippine Hospital Association, Dr. Almora, unless uh, Senator Kiko would like uh, to make a few comments. Okay, na, yeah. We don't want to keep the doctors. We know how busy you all are. So, Dr. Almora, um, which uh, government programs have assisted you along the way? Perhaps you can give us a situation. Or, and at the same time, uh, we've read a great deal about complaints from the private hospital sector, from fail health claims that remain unpaid, to the lack of nurses and the failure to provide a wage subsidy and other problems. So, uh, we are now giving you the floor. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, and to the members of the committee, and to all those in attendance in this today's hearing. Um, yes, we do have a lot of problems and challenges, and I did prepare uh, written state uh, manifestations on this matter. So please allow me, in the interest of time, to to read uh, what I prepared. Uh, the Philippine Hospital Association is an organization of all government and private hospitals, comprising 1,900. 86 members all over the country. Its membership is from the smallest infirmary hospitals to the biggest level uh, three hospitals. 40% of our membership are from the government hospitals and 60% are private hospitals. At the start of the pandemic, our level two and level three hospitals were identified as COVID referral centers while level one hospitals were assigned as triad centers and treatment facilities for mild COVID cases. Our COVID referral hospitals are considered the last line of defense in this war against the COVID-19 disease. The PHA regrets to inform the honorable members of the committee that despite some remaining bed capacities, the capability of our major hospitals in the national capital region and major cities around the country uh, uh, have been uh, overwhelmed and uh, they have reached their breaking point during the recent surge of COVID patients in, in the NCR and neighboring provinces and cities. The surge of COVID patients has also been seen in other major uh, uh, in other cities. Although there is a slight slackening of the surge, the capabilities of our COVID centers are continuously diminishing. This is not due to lack of skills or dedication or stamina of its health workers because they have been selflessly giving their best despite so many challenges for over a year now. But because of a confluence of several factors that came together at this stage to adversely affect our capabilities to respond to this crisis. Please allow me to present, to present the, the problems and challenges facing the hospitals and to give a brief analysis and recommendation if appropriate. First, the unprecedented and massive surge of COVID cases. This is due to many reasons, such as uh, more cases are being detected by the commonly available and fairly sensitive screening tests using rapid antigen tests. 
the opening up of travel restrictions during Christmas and thereafter, quarantine fatigue causing people to lower down their vigilance, change of mental attitude and perception of people to the COVID-19 disease because of proliferation of fake news and increasing acceptance thereof in the social media, leading to abandonment of social and physical distancing and wearing of PPE. And the sheer number of COVID cases is simply beyond the capability of existing manpower of the hospital. For this reason, Madam Chair, uh, an extension of uh, travel restriction uh, would help the uh, keep the number of cases low. And also, of course, the continuous uh, vaccination. Doctor, and, uh, if, I, if I may, the extension of travel restrictions, this is travel within uh, NCR or is this travel um, to the provinces? The problem is all over the country, Madam Chair, so this refers to all, to all over the country. Yeah, but okay. uh, while, while in the uh, meantime that we are waiting the for the reason being uh, that the government has carved out all kinds of uh, bubbles, so I was wondering if there you were making reference to any of these bubbles, yes, Madam Chair, uh, including the bubble uh, areas, yes, and okay. second, see, doctor, second is the lack of manpower, specifically the nursing services in the hospitals especially the private hospitals who only now have 30% to 50% of their usual nursing manpower. Why Please is it so me to... reduced, doctor? Yes, uh, Madam was Chair. That the, the, a, was that a shortage from before or the 30% is uh, a new development? Um, this is a confluence of so many factors starting the start of this millennium, Madam Chair. So let me just read oh, to I you the it. reasons for this. Yeah. Please allow me to briefly go back and review how we transformed from the largest producer and exporter of nurses in the world with a glut of nurses willing to work in the hospitals without pay, if only to gain experience That's that would right. qualify them abroad to a country struggling to fill up its own nursing requirement. We can start to recall the high demand of nurses as part of the demand cycle in the US during the latter part of the last millennium, extending to the first decade of this millennium. As much as 260 nursing schools sprung up to fill the demand, students flocked to the nursing school, including doctors. That's right. We exported a lot. We exported a lot of our nurses and our doctor nurses, but on or about the year 2008, it became apparent that more than one half of the nursing schools were producing graduates that cannot pass the nursing licensure exam. The quality teachers in the nursing schools were also part of the migration. And so the quality of nurses graduates deteriorated. As a result, there was a gradual phase out of the poorly performing nursing schools as recommended by the Commission on Higher Education and the state auditors from 2008 to 2013. The demise of these schools was also hastened by the dwindling job opportunity abroad. Then in school year 2016-2017, there were no college freshmen because of the K-12 program. This was translated four years later to absence of nursing graduates. This started in 2020 and will last until 2022. It came at a, at a time when we needed nurses the most. But whatever nurses was left to serve the hospitals, the steep increase in the salaries of the uniform services starting in 2018 created an exodus of nurses from the hospitals to the uniform services. As much as uh, 9,000 created an exodus, as much as 9,000 new policemen are now in the P PNP. How many? How many doctors? Sorry, just confirming. 9,000. 9,000 of new policemen are now nurses in the PNP doing non-nursing job. There was a bill to raise the salaries of nurses to 26,000 for entry level to solve this uh, exodus of nurses, but was vetoed by President Noynoy Aquino because of objection from the DBM, 
and the National Wages Productivity Board and the Philippine Hospital Association. This is for the reasons of lack of budget, huge salary distortion, and the unacceptable class legislation, and the expected tremendous increase in the cost of healthcare because the salaries of other hospital workers has to be increased as well to maintain peace in the workplace. This increase will have to be shouldered by the patients. Presently, it is only the salary of hospital personnel that are peso denominated. Everything else in the hospital, from medicines to supplies to reagents to equipments, are imported and dollar denominated. The price of these items in the hospital is the same anywhere in the world. Or peso earning Filipinos, as it is, has already much difficulty buying the dollar denominated items. If we raise the nursing salary to an amount near the dollar salary of nurses abroad, it will be a load 50 times the earning capacity of our ordinary patients. At this time, when the buying power of the ordinary Filipino has also gone down, healthcare will become inaccessible, contrary to the aims and purposes of the universal healthcare law. The massive demand by DOH of nurses to man the COVID tracing and monitoring efforts has been sourced out from the private hospitals. Whatever remains is further decimated by the growing number of nurses being admitted in the isolation rooms and COVID facilities of their hospitals because more and more nurses are infected by the virus. Meantime, foreign countries have again started aggressive recruitment of nurses, which is the other major reasons that we are having this healthcare manpower crisis. At this very critical moment, we appeal for reinforcement from the agencies of government, employing nurses, doing non-nursing jobs, to lend their nurses to the hospitals before the last defenses of this war, your hospitals will be totally overrun. In addition, a program to increase the number of nursing schools and student enrollees in nursing uh, colleges is hereby requested if only to assure supply of nurses in the coming years because we project that uh, the graduates that are expected in 2022 will not happen because they have also uh, there's a one year more than a year now that they're not going to school uh, so that would be uh, moved to 2023 and beyond that we expect that more and more nurses will still be migrating and we will still the lack of manpower of nurses will uh, go on uh, way beyond 2023 and so a program should be set now so that we will have still supply of nurses in the coming years. Third is the huge amount of unpaid claims to hospitals for COVID-19 reimbursement dating back the start of pandemic. So that was March last year. This is now causing severe financial distress of, of private this hospitals. Is still claims as against well still as health. Government. Sorry, doctor. Is this claims yes, against yes, still health as uh, we've read in the newspaper? Yes, Madam Chair, this is for That's COVID right. claims. Uh, only the non-COVID claims are being paid. Only, this is now did I hear correctly, Doctor, just to, um, to uh, verify, you are saying that non-COVID claims are being processed, whereas COVID claims are not being paid? Yes, Madam Chair, you're right. Why is that? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair. Why is that? Uh, what is the reason given for non-COVID claims being prioritized over COVID claims? That is the biggest problem because we are not given a reason why. Hmm. This is now causing severe financial distress of private hospitals as well as the government hospitals. So this is the what is not being paid for private and government hospitals. The big hospitals have tens and hundreds of millions of collectibles yes, for free uh, health. Sorry, um, this is a, uh, uh, this is uh, a non, this payment I think also uh, has been the case with the government hospitals such as the Philippine Heart Center and so on. Is that correct, doctor? All, govern, all government hospital, Madam Chair. All government hospitals? Yes, and private hospital and all over the country, Madam Chair. And since March 2020, 
Uh, given that your um, non-COVID uh, uh, patients have dwindled, um, what are you uh, what are you working on? What are what what is your operating uh, financing at this point? Yes, that 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 adds that uh, uh, um, aggravates the problem, Madam Chair, because the the decrease in the number of non-COVID cases to as much as uh, fifty to seventy percent decrease. Yes, uh, I was see that in my local hospitals. Yes, so there was there is already a decrease in the income of the hospitals from the non-COVID, right. and and they are they are treating COVID cases that are not being paid. So it is a compounded problem, Madam Chair. Madam Chair? Yes, um, yes. Senator Kiko, please. Yes, just very quickly. Uh, since March 2020, so how are the hospitals operating if uh, they have a decrease in non COVID cases and a uh, non payment of COVID cases? Uh, yes. And how much are we talking about in terms of uh, non, non remittances? Do we have uh, figures? If if not tonight, uh, if not today, uh, doctor, maybe you can submit it to the committee. Uh, I have uh, figures only for some hospitals, but uh, we were not able to get the total number. But uh, there is a hospital with 1.2 billion claim. Yeah, in the uh, billions, uh, 700 billion. Uh, and the uh, smallest for the COVID centers would be about 50 million. Uh, and, and despite non-collection, how how are not, how are they operating? Uh, where where do they get the, the the money to pay for their overhead, their salaries? Uh, yes, uh, they have to dig into their savings, and uh, they have to borrow from the bank. Uh, some hospitals who have called me already informed me that they have borrowed uh, from the bank for their operating budget, Madam Chair. This is this is well. This is unacceptable. Are you able to avail of any preferential uh, loans, or uh, are just borrowing uh, from your own private bankers? Sorry, Senator. Uh, no, no, no. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, they, maybe they have to somehow sort out from other assets that they have, and also from the bank. But remember, Madam Chair and um, um, Senator Pangilinan, that uh, uh, if the hospitals are not paid the doctor's component, the professional component is not also paid. So here are doctors working for the COVID patients, but they are not being paid. Except for those hospitals that accept co-payment. Uh, they, they, they accept co-payment from the chair, and this is, it is from the co-payment that they get uh, their professional fee, and also for a little of the uh, uh, hospital. For what is co-payment? Uh, Sorry for my ignorance. Co-payment co is the amount paid in excess of the Phil Health Benefit Package, Madam Chair. So yes. for, for for mild cases, we have Phil Health is going to pay forty-three thousand. For yes, moderate right. cases, seventy-three thousand. Yeah, and so for severe, seven hundred thirty and uh, one hundred three hundred thirty-three, and for critical, seven hundred eighty-six. But Studies show that uh, a patient admitted in a COVID uh, uh, ward or isolation room would spend about 28,000 to 30,000 a day because this is a special care facility with uh, PPEs for a three, at least three teams who work alternately and who are receiving salary even while they are under quarantine after their duty. So uh, a lot of other uh, important uh, uh, infection prevention control of the hospital that is being made to increase the cost of uh, the management of COVID. Uh, I, I'm sorry, doctor, and and the Phil Health has not given any explanation as to why they are not releasing the funds. That's right, Mr. K. Uh, my, my, senator, um, is this acceptable to you? It's not, <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you see, you, you see. <laughs> The hospital has has been uh, stymied, or they have learned. Yes, yes, yes. I, I understand. Obviously, it's not acceptable to you, but uh, uh, and neither is it acceptable to this committee. Uh, and uh, and uh, perhaps we should do something, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, perhaps a, 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 a we can uh, we can call for the PhilHealth uh, 
Uh, we have a, a couple of hearings still on the hard hit industries. And uh, as it goes, uh, the list becomes longer and the uh, the uh, government issues keep arising. So definitely let's call Phil Health for an explanation, Paul. That's right, because uh, at this point, parang uh, wala kaming pakialam sa inyo, magtiis kayo ang, uh, ang dating sa ating dito dahil uh, you are the frontliners and yet this is how you are treated by government uh, in terms of uh, uh, government support, in terms of funding. This is this is totally unacceptable, uh, doctor, and uh, uh, we must look into this and, and get uh, results. May 2020 pa, uh, March 2020, March. it's already May 2021. 14, yes, uh, uh, 14 months. You, you, you know, you are being asked to, to uh, feed uh, the multitudes with five loaves of bread and uh, two fish. This is, this is uh, completely unacceptable, and uh, we hope and we intend yes. uh, to akalam pagi natin yung fill up para hanapan ng solution. Senator Kiko, tulungan niyo kami. Tapos uh, maybe doctor as requested by Senator Pangilinan, kahit hindi complete listing ng mga utang ng fill health, just to give us an idea, kahit anecdotal kung anong meron kayo, please pass pass it on to the committee so I can share it with the rest of the senators. Thank you, thank you, Senator, yes. uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you, Doctor. Doc, Thank you. Doc, you said uh, Doc, you said uh, the governor, the government nurses who are performing non-nursing jobs, and I understand that I think sixty plus PNP have already gone to the hospitals, but there are others in schools and government offices. You rightfully yes. point out. Secondly, you said a program to increase schools and enrollees, and thirdly, ito ng collection sa PH uh, sa Phil Phil Health na pagkalakilake. Are there further recommendations, please? Yes, Paul. Uh, there is. Uh, I, I have to. I have to uh, make some qualification on the unpaid claims. We uh, wrote. We we wrote the president and CEO, Attorney Giran of PhilHealth, last uh, March 28, and we did have a meeting last uh, April 5, uh, for which. Uh, Attorney Giran was uh, sympathetic and accommodating, and he promised that they are going to pay. On April 8, three days after our meeting, they came up with Bill Health Circular 2020-004, creating the debit credit payment mechanism for the NCR and bubble cities like uh, Batangas, uh, Laguna, Bulacan, and Pampanga. Uh, for pay partial payment of 60% of the in-process claims. However, the private hospitals in this area are made to, up, to apply for this debit credit payment mechanism, which is uh, almost like the IRM, the, the, the demonized IRM, I would say. Uh, but the IRM is uh, an advanced payment. This time, it is considered a partial payment for reconciliation. Um, however, the hospitals were surprised why they have to apply and why they have to sign uh, uh, an undertaking. It is like a borrower who cannot pay and asking the one who lent him the money that he will be the one to do an undertaking. So Para it is a reverse. <laughs> Yun nga po. Kaya yung maraming hospital, na, na, nagulat sila. So, hindi sila nag-apply. So, we had another meeting. In-explain naman nila, never mind the undertaking, uh, just uh, just apply. Uh, forget the wordings, they say. Pero, uh, so somehow, may pakunti naman. So, in the NCR, may mga hospitals who applied and who received some amount which they consider small. And, uh, uh, the problem is uh, the. Umabot ba nung sixty percent na sinasabi, doc? Uh, sixty percent is uh, dependent on how much they would uh, consider sixty percent, the in the in process claims. So uh, we have no reason to doubt the intention of the PCO. We know that he is sincere and would like to really accommodate a request. However, the payment is made in the regional area, regional uh, offices. And apparently, it's the regional offices that is withholding the payment for some reason that we don't understand. But of course, some of the reason probably is because 
uh, the COVID cases, a new disease, there is no uh, clinical pathway guideline or there is no standard of care to be followed because it is an evolving process. The diagnosis and the yes, doctor, but having said process. that, but doctor, having said that, I went through the debates long ago over the inclusion of pneumonia. And I recall that DOH uh, argued that pneumonia should not be included when in fact that could have covered COVID. Yes, and uh, the, the one that is being used I now, don't the think I include no one. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> That 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 uh, circular that came out out of those debate is already antiquated because it was made in uh, March 28, 2020, when the COVID is starting, and that is the same circular that they are applying to assess the claims, uh, the present claims, which is the the way we understand and the way we diagnose and treat the disease have already uh, improved tremendously since that time. So they have to. Um, uh, come out with another circular that will properly address uh, the issues concerned. <clears throat> uh, uh, another, another challenge, uh, Madam Chair, is the inadequate field health benefit package. Um, the 43,000, 73,000, 333, and 786,000 for the different uh, uh, degree of uh, 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 the Are disease. you referring, Doc, to the outpatient or the in-hospital? Parehong in inadequate. In-hospital, Madam Chair, inadequate. Po. So that is uh, another problem which we would like to call the attention of PhilHealth to look into. If they cannot, uh, if they think that, uh, they, that uh, they cannot increase further, then at least they should allow co-pay. Because right now, uh, copay is not allowed, I see. and uh, if they will not allow copay, the hospital will incur losses. And this is the reason why some of the smaller hospitals, despite prodding from DOH, uh, does not admit the mild and moderate cases and, and uh, choose to refer them to the government hospitals, causing crowding in the government hospital, is because they are not allowed to accept copayment. So they can't afford it's, it. It's a matter of dumb if you do and dumb if you don't. So if yeah. they accept and does not charge copay, they will lose. If they will charge copay, they are in violation of field health uh, policy and therefore they are subject to losing their accreditation. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Have you made any uh, representation to DOH in all of this? After all, they also sit on the field health board. Yes, uh, we, uh, I have made some uh, uh, verbal request for a possible meeting between the OH, PhilHealth, and the Philippine Hospital Association, but uh, I was waiting for a word, and uh, uh, we are actually have actually come up with a letter, but I have not sent the letter yet. Uh, so we are need you to have that a uh, you, the the uh, DOH has not met with the association since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we were included only in some of the committee meetings, Madam Chair, but on the policy make some of the policy making regarding this COVID, we are not involved, Madam Chair. We are not a member of the IETF. We are not a member of um, uh, the uh, decision making body with regards policies for uh, healthcare. But we are in. We are part of the uh, price negotiating board. For the for the implementation of the universal healthcare law, yes, uh, we are part of the health facilities oversight board, which is the of body course. that hears the problem, uh, complaints against hospitals, but not in the policy making body for COVID cases. Uh, and COVID despite what Senator Pangilinan said, that you are in fact the real frontliners. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, and. <clears throat> I have mentioned already the low patient census, which is the one that is aggravating our financial problems, Madam Chair. That's right. Uh, yeah. On the issue of financial benefits to our healthcare workers, as provided for in the Bayanihan 1 and Bayanihan 2, and the corresponding administrative orders 28 and administrative orders 36, giving benefits to our healthcare workers, the 
DOH hospitals and LGU hospitals have been given their special risk allowance as provided for by Bayanihan by to heal as one act and administrative order 28. The provision of compensation of 100,000 pesos to public and private health workers who contract severe COVID-19 infection while performing their duties and a compensation amounting to 1 million pesos which shall be given to public and private health workers who will die because of COVID-19 is not consistently complied with. There are applications that are still How pending. How is that, doctor? Because we spent many hours and days and nights over by Anian to, to make sure that would be passed here in the Senate. And we would like to know why it's not equally and universally applied. There's still a great yeah. deal of money, Senator Kiko, in uh, Bayanihan too, by the way. Apakarami pampera, and we only extended it until the end of next month. I doubt if they'll be disbursing it uh, within that period. Apparently, so there, are, there are regional differences in the implementation of these uh, packages, Madam Chair. And uh, also, the provision of 15,000 for healthcare workers with mild to moderate diseases as provided for in Bayanihan to recover as one is also not consistently implemented or delayed. And number four, active hazard duty pay is being paid to government health workers, but the special risk allowance provided by administrative order number 36 for government and private health workers it's in also in Bayanihan one, doctor. Madam Chair? Yes, it's also in Bayanihan one. That's yes. reiterated there. Uh -oh. Yes. Uh, there is a, a varying interpretation on what the word direct contact means. Some interpret it as uh, pay, uh, workers who are directly uh, taking care at the patient bedside, but others interpret it also as includes other workers like the laundry women, the, yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the janitorial services, even the security guard. These are uh, they all all of them almost always come in contact, if not with the patient, with the uh, watchers of the patient. Of course, so maybe that's uh, doctor, ma Madam Chair. That, that's basic. The, 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 you can't tell the COVID virus to just uh, infect the doctors and the nurses. I, that's right. Well, what kind of you know? Why are we debating that? Uh, the bureaucracy seems to be more concerned about debating rather than uh, supporting and enla enabling our health uh, frontliners. Anyway, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for that information. Uh, yeah, it is yeah, it is for this reason that there is varying implementation uh, of this uh, provision. The, uh, for the private hospitals, uh, the most hospitals that I have talked to only receive one special risk allowance, while uh, some in some areas, some regions receive two special risk allowance. So there is also a varying implement implementation with regards to special risk allowance to the private hospitals, Madam Chair. I see. Um, yeah, there are many other problems of the hospital, Madam Chair, but I would rest on uh, those uh, challenges. Rest assured that we will give our best to fight to the finish despite the fast deteriorating manpower and financial resources that we are here now. And let me also uh, again express our gratitude for the offer to, to look into this, the for the Senate to look into this matter because we do need help from, uh, from, from uh, our uh, senators with regards to this matter of uh, unpaid COVID claims uh, from PhilHealth. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. I just had a quick question, Doctor, before I let you go. Um, you were talking about uh, the lack of nurses as being your uh, primary uh, problem. Uh, yung, uh, ba yung wage subsidy? Are there actually nurses that you can pay around or talagang kulang everywhere? I think it's just really lack of nurses, Madam Chair. Yung body it's count the absolute and, uh, lack of nurses, not just uh, the lack of uh, uh, wages or capacity to pay. Talagang lack. Lack, lack of nurses. Uh, ang migration natin, malaki, Madam Chair, they are still continuing. 
At uh, nung isang araw, hinayaan na naman. Senator Kiko, please. Yes, uh, there was a news report uh, on the return of 4,000 plus Filipino nurses uh, from overseas jobs. I think this was uh, last week uh, or uh, a few days ago. Uh, more than 4,000 Filipino nurses who lost their job because of the pandemic will return to their, will soon return. Uh, in other words, they would rather go abroad. They lost their jobs. They came home, perhaps a number of them, and now they're going to go back. Uh, uh, so uh, that... Uh, that's precisely. right, Senator Kiko. That's the reality. Um, as soon as they're repatriated, they're applying for redeployment. Yes. We have um, quite a few of them here in and, Ilocos. And the, the, yes. And, and uh, of course, because the disparity in terms of the distortion in terms of the, the pay, no? But the other thing is, uh, I'm sure it's aggravated by precisely all these uh, uh, inefficiencies in releasing all these uh, benefits. Uh, I remember a nurse who was computing her benefits and she thought she would receive X amount. And it turns out she didn't even receive half of the amount that she was uh, made to believe she was to receive. So that too is a big disincentive for, for nurses who uh, are here and uh, should be, you know, uh, able to apply for these jobs precisely because you have a 30 to 50 percent operating capacity, but would rather not. Uh, exposing themselves precisely to all these risks and not receiving, karampot na nga yung babayaran sa'yo, eh hindi pa binabayaran. Parang ganun din ang nangyayari, hindi ba? Doc, I yes. uh, just recall one last thing, Dr. Almora. It's um, it's the issue of the PPEs. Um, it has been observed that the uh, mortality and morbidity rate, ang infection rate ng health workers of Philippines, saksakan ng taas nasa up nasa 13 percent. Tama ba yon? Uh, versus the uh, international rate of only 2% because of the failure to protect, uh, provide the PPEs, and so on um, to our uh, frontliners. Is that yes, uh, a correct statistic? Uh, I'm, not really sure, I'm not really sure of the exact number, Madam Chair, but I do know that many hospitals are economizing already because, uh, it is, because like I said, it, uh, the benefit package is not enough. And uh, they are not able to accept copay. So they economize to the detriment of the protection of uh, our nurses. So uh, it is probably true, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I've seen them recycling PPEs. So uh, that's not a, a good sign. Yes, Madam Chair. And, and uh, Madam Chair, may I? Just to clarify, uh, uh, so it, the, it is also a huge disincentive when there are delays in the payment of these compensation benefits for our nurses uh, and of course even the doctors in Dibuba. it it does create some uh, you know negative uh, uh, negative uh, feelings or disincentive but this di sentence by our nurses uh, researchers and uh, we dig again uh, connected to the nursing manpower problem the, as i mentioned a while ago this will go on if we are to yes. look forward to it, this, this problem will go on even beyond this pandemic or even beyond 2024 because of the, uh, mainly because of the lack of teachers, qualified teachers. Most of the teachers have also migrated and the nursing school, even if they want to increase their enrollees, do not have already the qualified instructors that they need. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, just a manifestation. Um, this representation, together with I think seven other senators, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I think end of March or uh, first week of April, we wrote the Senate President requesting for a reconvening of the uh, Committee on the Whole of the Whole in terms of the uh, COVID response. Uh, this was uh, triggered precisely by the the uh, sudden surge. Uh, and, and the uh, uh, hospital uh, healthcare system uh, being in near collapse. Uh, I hope uh, the chair can, uh, based on all these manifestations, can support this uh, call. Uh, I think we had to postpone it or at least re uh, find a better schedule for it because one, we were on recess and two, there were That's some right. concerns being raised. 
Uh, but hopefully the uh, good chair can support this uh, bipartisan um, uh, request uh, for the Committee of the Whole on the uh, uh, COVID response be reconvened so that we can get uh, updates uh, as to the status of precisely these releases of funds, the challenges facing the uh, frontliners, uh, among others, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, we assure the good senator that uh, um, we are in full agreement that a uh, uh, one-year review and the exercise of oversight is um, necessary at this point uh, for this very urgent and important matter. So, thank you, uh, thank doctor, you, very, thank you very much, doctor. Um, if you would like to add anything, the uh, committee um, will welcome any position paper and certainly the uh, um, notion or at least some kind of idea of the scale of the loans involved in the PhilHealth um, sure. would help us as requested by Senator uh, Pangilinan. Yes, so, thank you very much, question. Doc. I don't want to keep you. I know you're exceedingly busy and beleaguered by all sorts of problems. Thank you very much for coming once again to this committee. You're welcome, Doc. Thank you. Oh, and thank you. Committee yeah. Secretary, we have the Philippine Nurses Association, I understand. Yes, and yes, sir. We have Governor, Governor Melbert Reyes, the National President of the Philippine Nurses Association. Okay, Gov, you are uh, recognized. Um, may we hear from the Nurses Association um, as quickly as possible because, as you know, we have quite a few guests, but we really need to hear from your group because, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Almora, you are one of the most uh, uh, precious sectors at this point and in shortage as well. Yeah, good morning, Madam Chair, and to Senator Kiko Pangilinan. Um, uh, first, first of all, before first of all, before I read our position, I first of all, before I read, I was the main source of the lack of manpower. It's not really a shortage of nurses, but uh, the maldistribution. Now we have nurses in the Department of Education, Bureau of uh, Fire, Bureau of Correction, the PNP, and other uh, uh, non-nursing field. No, it's because of the compensation and benefits primarily. No, and it's because of the value that uh, the government is giving our nurses. The Philippine Nurses Association, uh, the only, only accredited professional organization, uh, honored the sacrifices of Filipino healthcare workers that have made in service to the people. While the pandemic has ravaged economies, governments, and societies, some have pledged their lives time, resources, and personal space to help people in need of medical care. Filipino healthcare workers, including nurses, have once again proven their worth and value as they volunteered to help rebuild communities. Their efforts have laid the cornerstone of Bayanihan, hard work, solidarity, trust, responsibility, and unity. And unity. While their sacrifices is overflowing, nurses' rights and welfare must be respected at all times. With regard to rights, the collective rights are etched in the annals of laws and welfare policies. And for a long time, nurses as workers have liberally exercised them. The rights to have a decent wage, to work, to have a fair and just working condition, to form and join trade unions, among others, are assured by the 1987 Constitution and various laws. With regard to their welfare, much work remains to be done in order to fully give flesh to social legislation, as nurses' experiences shows. The present pandemic is the best example of how governance should address welfare concerns of nurses. For example, while the government has promised to pay the special risk allowance and hazard payment payments, most nurses have yet to receive the same. It has been a year since the two Bayanihan laws were enacted, yet the money owed to nurses remains to be distributed. Meanwhile, nurses continue to become vulnerable to COVID-19 without being fully compensated for their efforts. The time is ripe for the government to heed the calls of nurses to ameliorate their conditions. Nurses have been asking for these reforms. The government should give them decent compensation. It should increase their minimum daily wage. It must release their special risk allowance and special risk allowance. Finally, 
it must end contractualization and job orders mandatory overtime in all forms of un unfair labor labor practices give them positive working environment thus respect for nurses collective right is all about social justice it is about giving them the foundation to speak for the marginalized unorganized and unprotected workers it is about giving them dignity because as human nurses should never be exploited for the sake of efficiency for the issues of uh, for the issues of uh, lack of manpower we pna continuously uh, work with uh, the department of health the doa katulad po nung nabanggit ni senator kiko pangilinan yung 4000 uh, nurses we are looking into that po for possible uh, community opo for possible uh, program together with the uh, professional regulatory board of nursing uh, for possible augmentations to uh, the different hospitals that uh, need the manpower no. governor, and we also push yes sir. sorry governor melbert i was just going to ask uh, for a clarification you are disputing the uh, assertion of dr almora that there is a shortage of manpower and of uh, nurses what you are saying is the nurses are here in the philippines except that they're all over the place performing non-nursing jobs in much better paid positions in the pnp bfp bjmp DepEd, and elsewhere is uh, that correct exactly madam chair okay that's interesting but uh, i hear that the small number of nurses i understand 64 pnp nurses have been uh, uh, deployed to the hospitals, but on county naman nun. Um, yeah, yeah. Madam um, Chair, may we request uh, Mr. Reyes uh, if he can provide us uh, data, um, uh, whatever uh, available uh, that he has in terms of where they are deployed so that we can get a sense uh, of uh, precisely the, the situation on the ground. Uh, would you have off the off the top of your head, sir? Meron ba kayong information halimbawa? Sabi niyo na deploy sa iba ibang lugar. Um, meron ba kayong numbers uh, at this point? Or if not, you can just have it submitted to us uh, if you can uh, put them together. We will work on that, uh, Senator. Actually, the uh, Board of Nursing is working on the nursing workforce uh, study uh, with regards to that maldistribution because they believe na they are, we uh, we have lots of nurses here in the Philippines. Yeah, yes, yeah. para matulungan namin kayo kasi talaga namang very urgent na ito at uh, lahat sumisigaw at uh, nangangailangan ng nurse at this point suddenly na alala ang mga dakilang nurse natin. Yeah. So uh, if the PNA if the PNA would like to uh, submit a position paper adding to uh, the comments that you have made um I will be very happy to receive them um, in the future if you have other recommendations. Pero talaga nakakasama ang loob yung uh, uh, pagsabi mo ng kulang ng respeto, ng dignidad, ng honor. Eh, talagang nakakapagpagdamdamin po. Yes, po. Because, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we know that uh, during 2019, uh, we have uh, in our law, RA 9173, Section 32, that provides uh, nurses to have salary grade 15 as their entry level. That's no, but right. then it was not given. Uh, the law was passed 2002 until 2019 when a certiorari in Mandamus filed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court favored the salary grade 15. No, so but then until now there is a problem with the implementation because of the DBM circular 2020-4 that uh, creates a uh, um, uh, a demeaning uh, reclassification of position of nurses, wherein nurses nurse two becomes nurse one, um, a demotion of position. So, uh, parang yung value, uh, it shows how the government value nurses, no? So, yun po yung pinakang problems namin, problem namin dito. And, uh, oh, with Senator the PA, Kiko, uh, yung overturn na natin yung DVM na yan. Nakakapikon circular. At this time po, at this time of pandemic, our nurses working 
for the Filipino people are experiencing demotion because of the DBM circular 2020-4. No, with no, with the with the, what that the uh, good doctor said that uh, uh, that uh, was uh, about to be signed by the president then uh, uh, no 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 uh, but it was vetoed, no? uh, but it was vetoed in the public and the private hospitals, no. So we understood the yeah the financial uh, uh, um, implications of this, but uh, uh, we really need them to push for the rights of our nurses, no. The DFA secretary Loxin uh, said that uh, we cannot. Um, deprive nurses of looking for a better opportunities and the better opportunities for nurses are not here in the Philippines. So, paano po natin makontrol yung migration kung hindi natin migration kung para sa mga nurses natin. So, somehow, uh, makabubuhay ng pamilya ng nurses. Thank you. Sorry, your uh, audio is uh, fading. Um, but Thank you very much, Governor Melbert Reyes. And as I said earlier, um, any further comments will be welcome. Sorry, yung audio po ninyo nawawala. Um, okay. I think uh, we've heard the main gist of the uh, nurses. Meron pa kayong idadagdag, uh, Governor Reyes? Medyo hirap kami sa audio mo eh. Hello? Okay. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, yes, there we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. We hear you loud um, and clear. Sir, we and I will do our uh, very best to uh, address at least some of these uh, burning issues. We need our nurses and uh, they should be honored and respected and most of all paid adequately. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Paul Senator Kiko Pangilina. Salamat po. Thank you very much. And uh, now we can go to the hotels and restaurants, another very beleaguered sector, represented by Mr. Bobby Horrigan. Good morning, Madam uh, Chair, uh, Senator Pangilina, and distinguished guests. Um, uh, I don't have the position oh. paper right now. Uh, do you however... have a video? I'm um, sorry. Uh, um, do you have video or uh, wala kayong video ngayon? Um, di ko po kayo nakikita eh. There, there, Madam Chair. Ayun, ayun, okay. Chair. okay. There we go. Um, what do you call it? I don't have a, uh, we don't have a position paper. However, I can give you an update on the situation of the, uh, the uh, hotel and uh, restaurant, uh, hotel. Essentially, uh, essentially industry. we're aware that some of the hotels uh, managed to uh, make some uh, revenue through, uh, volunteering as isolation centers so i'm aware that at least a few were able to generate some income that way but by and large everyone is bleeding and hemorrhaging big time so correct, perhaps correct you can tell us uh what government programs have you actually availed of or have been of benefit to your sector and what else can we help you with correct uh, uh, madam chair uh just to give you an update uh, you know, uh, Metro, uh, Metro Manila, the occupancy of hotels uh, and majority of these hotels are are for quarantine as uh, and we're running about a 60 to 70 percent occupancy for, for NCR. Uh, the leisure hotels are, are running a lower occupancy. Now, uh, there were 10 hotels that were for leisure and uh, as of yesterday, it's up to 13. Now, Cebu and Davao are. Uh, are, are running a lower occupancy of about 20 to 30 percent uh, in their hotel. So that's basically a, a, a break even or even uh, losing some money. Um, there are hotels in Clark and in Cebu that are on quarantine. So they're doing uh, a better business right now. Um, 
Uh, we, we all know it's uh, all about vac uh, vaccination programs and hopefully uh, we're, we're crossing our fingers that this happens by the end of the year uh, because uh, that will be that will mean more flights uh, and local tourism can can start to boom. Uh, government has uh, put a program called the NERS, N-E-R-S, the National Employment Recovery uh, Service uh, Program. And uh, uh, we've been planning this for, for many months. And uh, yes, that's right. That was that was what uh, we launched. Is that right? On May 1 with DTI and Dole. Yes. Correct. Yeah, I'm Correct. there. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. And then, um, and then, of course, with the Bionian Act to uh, the 10 billion that was uh, allocated for the for, for as loans for the SMEs for for hotels and resorts, so uh, that is working right now. Uh, but that's largely untouched, Bobby. It's correct. Sorry, Madam Chair. It's, large, uh, it's largely untouched in the small business corporation. And we had a yes. um, meeting we, we, last uh, our last hearing. Nasa 3.3 palangal ng umutang. The others um, find it very difficult. Yeah. And of course, with this kind of economic climate, nobody's inclined. To uh, borrow, kung wala ka naman pambayad. Our our uh, our last meeting with the DOT and the IETF and uh, DTI, uh, the, we we were mentioning these things and uh, we're coming out with a, uh, um, we're asking we're asking government to make it easier uh, uh, to give out these loans, so that more more uh, hotels and and uh, resorts will will apply for these loans, um, and then uh, what do you call that? I actually We're thought in the of... Senate that it would be easier to put it in the small business corporation kasi hindi ka tulad ng banko na hindi kailangan ng collateral. But as it turned out, it's still too difficult for so many because uh, obviously the small hotels and restaurants have very understated income and uh, hence their borrowing capacity is similarly uh, devalued. Yes, Madam Chair. So... Uh, what what uh, these hotels are doing uh, currently across uh, the country is they're taking this time. Uh, most hotels are taking this time to uh, to restructure their 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 loans and uh, to uh, what do you call it to renovate. Uh, we're just very we're just very lucky that the the, the bigger the bigger hotels uh, have deeper pockets and uh, of course uh, some of them uh, that decided to close. They will just wait and, and, and see it out. Uh, we're, we're looking you, at the You better... mentioned renovate. Um, the uh, fit out to become uh, more uh, COVID, um, COVID uh, safe is very expensive because you have to open everything and make it more or less uh, uh, cross ventilated, less air con, uh, so many sanitation requirements hand washing and water facilities everywhere um in order to renovate uh, you have to borrow money is that what's occurring i am uh, or is it just the larger hotels that are capable of digging into very deep pockets in order to renovate Ang mahal mag -fit out, eh. yes the, the larger hotels are taking this time uh, because uh, you know, a lot of these hotels haven't been renovating for the last 10 to 13 years because, you know, uh, business has been good uh, uh, prior to 2020 March. So so they're taking time to, to do the renovations right now. The smaller hotels, um, are they able to avail of any of the loans of these uh, preferential windows in order to fit out for reopening post-COVID? Uh, yes, they're actually working on on applying on these loans, and we're 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 informing them that the process is going to be easier now. So Excellent. we're going to be looking for 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 that to happen. And also the effort to digitize that can also be the subject of the loans in the SBC. Yes, uh, all the online platforms, uh, the selling, the online tourism, all that stuff. Requires yes. some money too. Yes, we we had discussions with 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 uh, with Congress, and uh, you know, if we needed, if uh, if government needed to use the uh, the other hotels as uh, quarantine facilities for mild and asymptomatic cases, so so we were we were recommending that we use the the closed hotels because there's quite a number of hotels that are closed, but they will get paid. So this is something that the owners would be open to 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 do. No, I was uh, quite surprised in one of the president's IATF meetings. Uh, there was a threat of uh, taking over some hotels 
for isolation and so on. Um, was your association uncooperative in any way to engender such a comment? No, not, no, not at all. Uh, it's just that when we were discussing uh, between ourselves and we said, you know, there's a quite a number of hotels that are closed uh, nationwide, so we can we can use these uh, facilities first. But, you know... Uh, oh, yes. But, you know, for NCR, we've been very fortunate because uh, we have maritime, a lot of maritime business, off-signers and on-signers, meaning off-signers, people from the, the ships are all coming back to uh, to Manila as the entry point. And then uh, what do you call uh, on signers or the people going leaving uh, uh, Manila to go around the, uh, to the different destinations around the world. So these maritime companies, the money pay very well. So we've been very fortunate. And uh, OWA, o OWA has been paying regularly to the hotels. So NCR has, uh, we're, we're lucky OWA that we, paying we survived. For, for the OFWs. These are, yeah, these are the OFWs, Madam Chair. Yes, correct. I see. Okay. So that's that, that's where we are right now, and we're we're looking uh, uh, at third and fourth quarter to be better than uh, uh, than the last one than the last one year. We're seeing more flights going into Bacolod, into Davao, and and uh, to to the other areas around the Philippines. So, uh, you know, we're just we're the most important right now is vaccination. Eh? Right, of, of people, course, of the people, the of our front disaster. Yes, what I would like to ask you finally, we are very fortunate. We have the presence of the minority in the person of Senator Panglina, and I'm sure he's going to support us with this. Um, ano what else can we do for the hotels? Because we're quite alarmed by the uh, decrease in tourism traffic and uh, we... the uh, rampant unemployment. And dami pa unemployed na hotel workers. Yes, and and that that's uh, what. What can we do? Uh, it would be really local tourism to open up local tourism, and uh, and and va and vaccinations. And I know it's happening already in 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 Baguio. It's slowly going into uh, the other areas, and so hopefully Cebu and Davao will will follow. Because they're following the A1, A2, so we're almost to the A4. Oh, what's so that? A4, A4 now. now. A4 now, so what's oh, that? Oh, that's A4. So yeah, once, uh, once, uh, once the vaccine. That'll be branding for the Philippines because uh, once we can tell people, uh, once we can tell people that uh, our frontliners in, in the hospitality industry are, are vaccinated, then people are more confident to stay in our hotels. Okay. Uh, last question. Um, are you feeling the love from DOT? What have they done for you lately? You know, we, we've been meeting with the uh, the DOT on a regular so basis. You mentioned and, uh, local tourism. We're not feeling the love any locals. We're just uh, hyper local. Uh, sariling sikap po kami rito. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, we're, we're actually uh uh feeling their their presence and uh, they're great. they're giving us all the all the support for for all our properties uh nationwide all right so it's not that bad yeah we complain a lot but you're right they've been around yes at least they listen thank you uh senator kiko senator um, Pangilina. Yes, senator uh, Pangilina, please. yes uh very quickly uh uh mr horrigan um, I see that your your emphasis is really on uh, a, a successful vaccine rollout to be able to really uh, restore you confidence. No? In, in... Somebody. Uh, uh, no? uh, uh, eh. <laughs> Senator Pangilinan. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, but, but. Sendong Wait, mic is on. But, uh, non -bat, non -bat. Yeah, he he should uh, he should uh, un, uh, mute himself. Uh, okay, uh, and, and you're 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 really relying on at this point a successful vaccine rollout so the confidence in uh, you know in uh, being protected from from the illness is is uh, achieved and therefore people will go out. Um, in the U.S., for example, uh, they do have okay, so far, come relatively, come obviously, very successful exemption. vaccine rollout, and uh, uh, thus far, has they have been able to open up. Uh, we are still, uh, uh, we have yet to get there, relative to the U.S., uh, but I understand, uh, I read in the papers, 
uh, in the news that they actually put together this. I mean, they are already successful with their uh, relatively successful in their vaccine rollout. Uh, and yet they're still providing stimulus for the restaurant uh, industry, the, the uh, restaurant revitalization fund of 26 billion. And I'm told one week after it was uh, announced, uh, uh, the applications have reached 38 billion uh, dollars. Uh, would you see, you know, a similar intervention perhaps uh, here in the country? Uh, uh, and uh, would that be something that uh, your sector, the hotel and restaurant sector, would be willing to uh, support? Uh, you're you're muted. I, mean, my, my, my point, I, I, I point, understand. Yeah, yes, just just to complete it. My point okay. being, here you have the United States, they're, you know, relatively very successful in their rollout. Uh, I'm hearing in, in in the information in Italy based on 13.7 million who have been uh, vaccinated uh, beginning uh, December 27 up to May uh, 3, that uh, their report, the Institute of Health of Italy is reporting that uh, 80 percent uh, reduction in infections, 85 percent reduction in hospitalizations, and uh, 90 percent, uh, 95 percent reduction in deaths. In other words, they are succeeding in the, their vaccination rollout, and so is the U.S. And yet the U.S. Uh, also still has the stimulus package uh, for the restaurants. Uh, so you are now saying we need to have the vaccine rollout, but is that enough? Apart from that, would you welcome or support precisely uh, a stimulus package that will uh, provide assistance to revitalize the hotel and restaurant industry? Senator Pangilinan, I, uh, we understand. Uh, the U.S. Uh, have, has these amazing uh, programs, and even like in Singapore, uh, they subsidize a lot of room nights in, in, for hotels, and they do uh, uh, different programs for for restaurants. Uh, of course, we we welcome all of this uh, if if uh, government uh, can help us. We understand, uh, you know, uh, we're not like Singapore, uh, uh, and uh, you know, there there are other countries uh, even in worse positions uh, than us, like Thailand. So. Uh, what we're just uh, doing is we're just relying on on uh, local tourism. We're, we're very fortunate that pre-COVID, we had 113 million uh, uh, domestic uh, travelers, more than other countries in Asia. So so we're going to be relying on, on that, on local tourism for our resorts and even for the city uh, uh, hotels. But uh, correct, uh, we, we welcome uh, uh, all... all uh, all stimulus uh, uh, packages that we can get uh, for our industry. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Laha, so the minority is going to support that. Malakas na tayo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Mr. Horrigan, Ms. Sincha, Ms. Mercy. Maraming salamat po for joining us. And please feel free to submit any further opinions. At this point, we recognize you, my Madam good Chair. friend. Maraming salamat. You can go ahead, po, kasi I know you're all very busy. Uh, please go ahead. Um, Mr. Lee Chu, David Lee Chu, the executive officer of the property consultants. Ito naman yung real estate. Kumusta na? Uh, good, good morning, Senators. <clears throat> thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, th things, could be, uh, things could be better, but things could also be much, much worse. So we'd rather stick to, uh, to the status quo. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we're quite concerned about uh, what appears to be a decline in the real estate sector. We had the construction sector the last hearing, and uh, we'd like to understand the ramifications in the rise in prices, the uh, challenges to the supply chain, and so on that have occurred in that sector that uh, definitely impinge directly on your sector. We also are aware of um, an early exodus of the POGO operators, a prime uh, rent market and would like to be updated in that regard thank you please proceed thank you ma'am um, I have a couple of slides that we just want to show you in this very short uh, time that we have um, are the slides for so, committee secretary are we able to slide share uh, Beth I think admin is with us Patulong lang i-share yung slides ni uh, Mr. Lichu. 
Sila po yung magshare senator. Oh. Uh, ah, okay, okay. Fine. Opo, sila po. Oh, okay. I um I'm Pero yung admin na sa iyo dai. Senat ah Ano ba? Paano ba gag Well, and anyway, ma'am, uh, for the interest of time and because we uh, the, the slides can follow, but um, we, we, we just want to highlight that there's been a big decline in demand for the office sector and the property sector coming from two industries, mainly the BPO companies and the POGO sector, and they continue to shed space, although they're doing it at a much, much slower pace. Uh, not all is bad because even though transaction volumes of new leases is down by 70 to 75 percent, uh, we still have 30, 35 percent of new leases happening in 2020, happening in 2021. So that's the good news. And not all is lost because uh, even with even with this lower number, we are still one of the highest we're still one of the highest markets in the world as far as uh, new leasing is concerned. And we have to thank the BPO sector for that, which is a big chunk yes. of the demand driver. And the big question yes, um, is- David, that's what I was going to ask you about the Dan Safe and uh, uh, the uh, group of uh, Ray Untal and uh, the BPOs were here and they had quite an optimistic picture uh, um, moving forward um, because of the cost cutting elsewhere in the world, uh, the uh, BPO employment numbers would ratchet up. So um, um, while the POGO is diminishing, it appears that P BPO is growing. Um, why did you say that there was a big decline in that area? Was that only 2020 or? Uh, well, um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a difference between 2019 numbers and 2020, 2021 numbers. Okay. So they're, they're growing at a significantly slower pace is probably the best way we can, we can put it. I see. And so a, a lot of that, what, what can facilitate and stimulate their growth here in the Philippines is to just make things easier for them to do business here. And one of the things that we've been concerned with is the uh, amount of Tesla space that is available throughout the country. And we have to make the government appreciate that. Um, the amount of not, what space, the, sorry? The amount of uh, Tesla space. I see. Uh, has been fairly limited. And we would encourage the government to approve more PESA spaces, including the ones in Manila, because, right. because we need Manila to be. And, yes, uh, I mean, that's been a, uh, a constant gripe of this committee that there have been no PESA declarations um, in the last few years. Yes, so, so the PESA uh, proclamations have been fairly limited. And even even the ones in the provinces are are waiting, and uh, and the and and PESA has that list. So I, I won't belabor that, but I, I think it's important for the government to appreciate that in order for the in order for the BPO country uh, companies to continue to grow. Ako, Senator Kiko, yan na uh, yung PESA space na yan executive hindi natin kaya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yung special eco zones yeah. parating tinututulan ng DOF at NEDA kasi um, tax losses pero um, di natin kaya eh puro executive declaration yan eh that's right that and uh, well we know how it happens there <laughs> yes uh, and and so I guess I guess uh, I, I guess whatever little help that we that the industry can get in terms of getting more PESA accreditation would be fantastic. But, that's right, that's right. Uh, the, um, the, at least the, under the at least under the create regime, we were able to insert some changes. So hopefully there uh, are some uh, incentives that will be uh, uh, relevant. Uh, yes, ma'am. And, and we're very appreciative of that. The, the, the second um, matter, which I think will go a long way, will be lifting the density restrictions. So across all sectors, whether it's restaurants or hotels or office space, if we can, if we can increase the densities now 
for example are these covid uh, restrictions or uh, in general i guess uh covid restrictions covid related restrictions for example in the in the hardest of lockdowns we only allowed 30 percent of the yes. workforce to be in the office and now i think it's about 50 percent and i think we can afford to relax that a bit because uh that will probably be the best compromise to save many more jobs uh the bpos need to go back to the office and more have to go back to the office if more go back to the office then many jobs will be able to be saved like the restaurant That's business right. the, the logistics business and uh, transport and the yes, other thing i think uh, the uh, bpop uh, made the same plea in uh, a previous hearing uh, that the bpos cannot all work from home and uh, they've learned the limits of that as well now Another another plea of the BPO sector is that currently they are allowed to to do 30% work from home. Yes. And of of the 30%, uh, they continue to enjoy tax incentives up to September. And after September, I think that policy is going to be under review. And yes. they, they are pleading that to extend. Yes, uh, to indefinitely extend it because a combination of work from home and live office will probably give the Philippines the best one, uh, the best advantages against competition uh, around the world. And it will just facilitate the BPO sector to grow with more options of operating here. And then, of course, uh, a lot of the sentiment will improve once we are uh, once we have meaningful vaccinations in place but yes. this is this is this slide uh right down the screen that we're showing is uh the amount of demand that has come down and the, the demand actually is being saved right now by the bpo sector because uh the pogo sector has totally disappeared in the last uh, 15 months you uh, said totally disappeared is well, that correct in terms of, in terms of new leases so I they have see. not drawn up any new space. They have stopped growing. And in the last 15 months, the Pogo sector has contracted by 20 to 25% of their footprint in terms of office and residential take up. And therefore, it's, it's been a big impact also to tourism and to, and to retail and, uh, and the shopping malls and, and general economic activity. Uh, and thankfully, the BPO industry continues to grow even though at a slower pace. Now, if we can go to the second slide. Sorry, um, next slide, please. This shows you the impact of, uh, the impact of construction uh, because many of the projects have been delayed. Right because of COVID and because of uh, work protocols. And again, to increase the, the density required in the workplace, for example, construction sites are significantly impaired. And because they're significantly impaired, many, many small to medium sized and micro businesses are, are almost closing because the contractors cannot fulfill and cannot keep their head above water. So, um, our plea would be to increase the amount of people allowed in the work in the work in the workplace and in the construction sites, uh, whether they're apartment buildings like units under renovation or massive construction sites for buildings. Because this delay in the supply is not just a delay in construction activity; it is also a delay in jobs being made available for this fiscal year or the next fiscal year. Because if, if the job, if the buildings are yes. late, the jobs cannot be generated by the companies that want to operate here. And therefore, the real estate taxes, withholding taxes, VAT, uh, that would be due for all those leases and all those jobs will also be delayed. And sure, it all cascades down the line. Yes. And so the faster we vaccinate and the more people we have on site, the faster we can finish these buildings and more revenue is generated by everybody. 
And the purple line shows you the, the PESA space. So of all the total office space that's under construction, the purple line shows you the proportion of PESA space. And it's very low. It's one of the lowest we've seen in, uh, in a number of years. And we need that to go up because any change, the, 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 the lower horizontal line, dash line that you see there, is demand for 2020, which is one of the lowest demand numbers we've seen in a long while. But any significant recovery and improvement of that demand line will pretty much wipe out a lot of office space on the market. And that will translate to rental inflation, which if, if unbridled will, will become painful for many, it will make us uncompetitive. But by Senator relaxing- Trump. Yes, Senator Pangilinan. Yeah, so it makes me curious, why are we rushing the retail, the Foreign Investment Act? We push the create, but in fact, we don't want to approve any echo zones. So, uh, and there's no peso space being uh, created. It's, uh, it's very curious. Um, the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, maybe. Uh. <laughs> yep, I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head. Yes, David, please proceed. And, and so I, I think the, the, the more we accelerate these construction projects, the better for everybody involved, including tax revenue of the government. Now, um, I, I've talked to many construction companies and really they have said two things. Uh, well, the vaccination will have a dramatic improvement because besides the density, many of the workforce don't want to go back on site because they're afraid of getting yes. old vaccination program will solve that but the second thing is that the the the, the government allowed for sm uh, msme funding uh, through the banks but the banks have not been lending as much as they should to the msme and therefore many msmes especially after this recent lockdown will not be able to survive the next few months in um in uh david if i might interrupt uh, in the last hearing both dbp and land bank were here and both of them said it was the lack of take up but in fact uh, all the funds were available and they were doing their uh, level best to market all these uh loans uh it was the msmes that weren't stepping up because they were anxious couldn't comply with documentary requirements that were already simplified you're now saying that it's the banks that refuse to lend is that uh, what i understand uh this is what i am told anecdotally by a number of the contractors and architects and design firms that we have talked to in the last few days and um they they really are the point of of uh of, uh, I guess, loss of morale because they can't get their operating capital working through because this delay means that many of the designers, contractors who were supposed to, let's say, renovate apartment buildings now have to wait one year or nine months and they can't wait that long. Um, it's really a survival issue. Now, the MSME loans that you're referring to, these are bank uh, that are private or uh, these are uh, government banks that we can uh, I, guess, I guess private banks and government banks in general halo, halo na yan. yeah and and uh, no the, the and from uh, from my first hand experience I, I do know that many banks massively curtailed lending because of the high risk involved in lending during the last 12 months however it goes against the spirit of the government's uh, providing funding to the banks and uh, and policies to protect MSME if they cannot release funds to the market and yes. I'm sure I'm sure there's a story behind that it's not as simple as how how each side is portraying it and and I would encourage that we go look into it to see what the hurdles are to release funding because many companies that are in the construction industry are small and micro-sized companies and they're not going to survive the next three to four months 
That's correct. A lot of them are uh, just family operations that are uh, specialized. So uh, I'm a little bit confused. Perhaps the banking sector, we need to invite them. And as you say, investigate uh, farther and deeper uh, as to the reasons, because uh, the bankers um, are, uh, I suppose, bankers because they are by nature risk averse. But uh, in this pandemic, it's important that uh, we push loans out the window as quickly as we can. So thank you. Yes, and and um, if Iba kasi sinasabi nung last time eh, uh, Senator uh, Pangilinan. Iba sinasabi ng mga bankero na pumunta rito na may loan hesitation talaga kasi tatakot nga maraming uh, maraming natatakot kasi pandemic nga naman, but ka naman mangungutang. Wala yes. ka namang kikitain na pambayad. So I don't know where uh, the uh, problem lies. I, I'm sure it's somewhere in the middle. There we go. Yeah, confidence. And then, and then precisely a vaccine rollout, an effective, efficient, quick vaccine rollout will restore confidence, whether you're the borrower or you're the lender. Yeah, no, there's no getting around that. And then, yes, the grid, sorry. If, if we can go to the next slide, please. Yes. Or is this the last slide? Okay. Uh, a number of companies, this is the rate of contractions across the entire Philippines and the contraction of office space. Every square meter accounted for in the entire Philippines that's contracted. And it's divided between three industries, the POGO sector, the BPOs, and the uh, conglomerates and corporates. The yellow line shows you the total contractions. And you can see, thankfully, that that curve is already declining which means that fewer and fewer companies are contracting. And while the, the BPO sector contracted also, it's no, not spared by the COVID situation, it's only contracted by a tune of 1% of the total occupied space of the BPO sector. So that's the good news. And we have to prepare for a recovery, as Ray Untal mentioned in the last hearing. Um, and I, I do hope that the POGO sector does get sorted out and that they join the fray because both we need both to be able to generate as much jobs and revenue for everybody. And I- What do you hear on the ground from the POGO sector? Are they still uh, railing against the DOF and uh, BIR and so on? Or um, uh, do they still want to remain or come back to the Philippines? I understand some have uh, left for good. I, my, my personal view, ma'am, is that uh, the, the Philippines will be better off with more pogos here than less. Uh, and and whatever. At least for your industry. I'm sorry. At least for the real estate and development sector, that's for sure. Well, it, it's how big it's, an it's, impact? If you have to give a number, how big an impact on? Uh, Total uh, on total demand did Pogo have? Uh, well, they're the largest tourism driver today. They're the largest buyers of malls. I don't have the quantified number of that, but 1.7 million times 0. 0.25, that's 425,000 square meters of office space times 1,200 times um, uh, 12. That's about 6, six uh, billion. Uh, pesos in in so that's 12 billion in rent at the minimum so that's 12 billion in real estate taxes uh the, the, the corresponding real estate taxes vat withholding tax is what we're losing that's right so 12 billion of that plus the number of employees that have been lost so that's uh if if i can estimate that's about uh So that's about 100,000 employees, uh, some of them local, some of them foreign, who, who have lost their jobs in the Philippines, which means they're not renting apartments, they're not buying uh, goods in the, in the mall, et cetera, et cetera. The 12 and, billion in rent is um, what fraction of the total uh, office space? Um, that, that would be about 20% of the office space. As big as 20%, because I remember the previous uh, calculations were only 10% or so. The, they, they've contracted about 20% uh, of their footprint, about 
yeah, about 20% of their footprint, ma'am. But this is 20% of their footprint uh, in contraction, 20% also of total office space, is that correct? Yes, yes, ma'am. So of the, the total industry occupies 1.7 million square meters of office space and 2 million square meters of residential space. And, and they've given up 20% of, of, of those numbers. Oh boy, that's a lot. Uh, y y yes, it is. And uh, yeah. And uh, before COVID, uh, and before the disputes with, with, the, with, the, with the taxes, uh, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they were going to grow meaningfully and continue to grow meaningfully. But then I guess that's another discussion altogether. But I, I'm, I'm, the, the, the whole point here is that with this slide is that the contraction seems to be slowing down. And that's a good thing. That's right. And uh, again, increasing the density allowed to work in office space, in construction sites, in restaurants will go a long way in terms of increasing this recovery. Now, uh, there are last two things that I, I would like to highlight. And one is that uh, we anticipate a very big boom in the tourism sector. We meaning uh, our, our company. We think that within 10 years, the tourism industry will be the biggest industry of the Philippines, bigger than overseas remittances, bigger than uh, the BPO sector. And one of the things that cur curtail it consistently is that many properties are untitled. And many properties, because they're in far-flung provinces that nobody cared about for many years, uh, I guess the, right. the titling is limited. And therefore, the owners who want to sell cannot sell it to just anybody. They, they can only sell it to people who are brave enough to take on to buy tax deck properties. And then it's very hard to fund because the owners who want to build hotels cannot build on it because the banks won't lend on tax decks. And there are other issues like the, consistently there are zoning restrictions yes. that are outdated in resort areas. And if we can if we can facilitate the titling process, then yes. it will accelerate the buildup of malls and hotels all across the countryside. And that will be exciting because we've built a lot of roads, especially in North Luzon. We've built a lot of That's airports right. in the Visayas and Park is opening. And, and that is the last piece in the puzzle for tourism. And that's why I'm very optimistic about how tourism will play in the next 10 years. But we have to facilitate the creation of hotels and similar destinations for Philippines. And- uh, Yes, that's a, that's a useful reminder, David, because uh, we are working on simplifying title and also reviewing government properties, given that, uh, uh, beach fronts are obviously Republic of the Philippines owned, as well as many mountain sites that are actually of interest to the tourism sector. Purus timberland yan and non-alienable. So we have to find friendlier, investment-friendly um, holdings and titles to those so that they can be developed now. Thank you, ma'am. And then Reaching to the choir, in other words. Yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then uh, last two things. Um, one is that we we have to prepare and brace ourselves for the next problem, which is global inflation. And across almost every product has increased in cost everywhere around the world. For example, uh, Bloomberg two days ago came up with an article. One of the things that they've... Uh, what they've highlighted is palm oil, which is one of the basic cooking, cooking oils in, the, in uh, used by people, has gone up 135 percent in the last 12 months. COVID restrictions plus the Asian swine flu has has pushed pork up uh, by 100 percent to 120 percent in the last 12 months, and steel has gone up 70 percent in the last 12 months. And this is just some examples of many, many, many products that are going up all across uh, commodities, products, industries, and that's going to hurt the poor the most. And we have to prepare ourselves for that. It's a big problem that is around the corner. 
And well taken. Uh, yeah. We're already feeling it. The agricultural sector is heavily represented today, and uh, that's all we talk about, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and then one, n not to be facetious or anything, but uh, I think one other piece of regulation is increasing the speed limit in highways. <laughs> So from 60 or 80 or 100, we can probably do better with a bit more to get to move the cars out of the highways faster. They will consume more gas and therefore pay more taxes. And uh, the guys who, will, who have big fancy cars will be able to buy more. And again, that will just translate to more tax revenue for the Philippine government. <laughs> you sound like my brother. Thank you. <laughs> well, that, that's it for me, man. Thank you very much, David. And uh, we take cognizance of all the recommendations, many of them uh, insightful, perceptive, and truly helpful as usual. Uh, the number of pesos, which uh, I keep lobbying for, uh, the lifting of density restrictions, which we have to await, and hopefully the vaccine rollout uh, uh, speeds up and becomes meaningful, as you said. Uh, the 30%, we should do something about that shortly. And uh, the other efforts um, uh, entitling that uh, you bring to light, uh, that's a good reminder since we are in the midst of uh, the uh, DAR and uh, DENR uh, regulations um, and uh, this issue of inflation. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, if there are any further uh, recommendations, even if they involve Swiss speed limits, the committee will welcome them. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> okay, so I think now we have the agricultural sector. Mga uh, natin. Um, Beth, who will present among the agricultural sector? Kasi ang dami po nila. Uh, who shall we call in the agricultural sector? Uh, narito si Anna Go. I think we've not heard her before. And uh, the maize sector engineer Navarro. I'd like to hear from you guys because kayo, uh, kayo yung downstream ng uh, hog raisers na hindi narinig. Beth, sino pa ang nariyan? Baka ginutom na lahat. <laughs> yeah. Nandito po yung film is, ma'am. Oh, sige. Kayo na. Sige. Sino yan? Uh, engineer Sin Navarro? Yeah, Roger Navarro po. Magandang uh, araw po sa lahat. Magandang araw sa iyo, ma'am. Uh, maganda ka pa sa araw talaga, ma'am. Maraming salamat oh, oh. at uh, na-invita kami dito. <laughs> First time po. No? So, uh, anyway, ang amin lang naman, ma'am, ang alburoto namin, ganun pa rin. Uh, Siyempre, ang uh, policy ng atong government is that... Uh, Hindi talaga Wait, po ano yung presyo? Kasi parang yung presyo maayos naman kahit may ASF. Tama ba o nagkakamali sa shortage? Well, uh, in the last four years, ma'am, uh, talagang hindi maganda ang uh, presyo ng mais po. No? In the last two years, napakaganda ang ani. Uh, yes. kaya, uh, pero hindi naman maganda yung presyo. So, hindi nagkatotoo yung projection na magandang ani, magandang kita po. No? So, magandang <laughs> ani po, pero lang kita yung farmer. No? So, well, uh, nangyayari sa rice ngayon. Ang ganda-ganda ng ani, wala namang kita. Kaya nga po. So, uh, that's the very uh, sad part sa ating problema po. No? So, uh, anyway, sana po, ma mayroon tayo talagang uh, magandang... Uh, hadikain sana yung mga structural parity ship no sa agriculture po. Uh, with regard to maize, ano magagawa natin sa pamahalaan? Kasi worried nga kami dahil nga dito sa problema sa baboy kung ano yung impact sa inyo. Hello po, narinig niyo ako po? Ah, uh, medyo mahina. Laksan lang konti. Yeah, malayo kasi ako ma'am, nasa Mindanao po. Okay lang, dinig na kayo. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, yun yung mga kailangan natin, ma'am. If you remember, uh, nung panahon ng, ng tatay mo, ma'am, uh, maganda yung uh, uh, hadikain ng ating rice and corn. No? Kasi ang tawag nung araw ng NAP, ma'am, may rice and corn administration po. No? 
So ibig sabihin talagang kasama yung corn po uh, at saka yung rice. Pero nitong panahon na ito ma'am, since the ratification ng RTL, yung rice tarification law, eh ang NAP po ma'am ay nagiging uh, rice-centric na po. No? So uh, hindi na po sila nagtutulong sa mais po. Kaya ang mais po ay eh, nagiging orphan. Wala na talagang ahinsya na tumutulong ng mais. Kaya if you notice in my uh, first uh, presentation po kanina, Talagang mataas ang ani pero walang kita po kasi walang tulong po. No? Walang ahinsya na po, parang nakalimutan yung mais doon sa RTL po. Kasi nung Actually, ako, meron na nga akong bill tungkol dyan eh, ta, na magkaroon ng Philippine corn. Kasi nga, parang yun nga, naulila nga, naiwan sa ere. Yeah, actually, meron kami yung sanang padala sa iyo ma'am kasi this is already now being considered by DA. As part of their program, the creation of the Philippine Corn Development Administration, po, no? Hindi yung pung hindi kailangan po natin yung research po na kasi ang agronomy side po is very well already parang natutunan ng mga private sector po. The 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 what we really need is more applied research. But it should be under the auspices ng uh, Development Administration po ng CORN. Ipapadala e, namin sa iyo yung draft, ma'am, para sana po makonsider para, at, uh, Yan na rin ang na-file ko eh. Finile ko na rin yan eh. Very early on. I think uh, pag-upo ko, halos sa uh, umpisa pa lang ng term ko, noong 2019, nag-file na ako ng Philippine CORN Development. So ay, sa, saan sa, po ninyo yung support ako? Ay maganda sa maganda yon ma'am kasi sa ngayon po uh, yan ang answer po for uh, the next cropping if you ngayon kasi nagtatanim na kami ma'am sa August po at sa uh, September harvest na yon po ma'am ang problema namin right. uh, siyempre siyempre ma'am pag harvest ng September August maulan yon so wala naman right. pa post harvest facility at saka storage right. eh for nada na naman yung presyo ma'am na uh, false hope na naman yung magandang kita no So, yeah. kaya yun talaga ang problema namin, ma'am. Tapos ang budget naman ng corn, ma'am, napakaliit. Since we open up with WTO, 60 million lang budget, ma'am. Eh ngayon, ngayon, eh, ang budget is 1 billion lang, ma'am. Tapos ang kailangan natin sa post service facility, almost 200 billion. Uh, kaya kailangan natin ng other, other uh, policies to really address this problem. Eh, may combination naman, ma'am, kasi sa ibang bansa, mayroon silang sinasabing viability gap fund. Uh, this this gap fund will address more or less a viable project, for example, for corn, for the establishment of post-harvest, na hindi naman viable yung mga proponents like us, farmers, no? So, sana po yung equity portion namin, eh, kailangan eh, bigay ng uh, ating uh, corn program, and then the other one will be under the guarantee of EC. EGFP, yung ating uh, pondo po na nalilikom because of the banks that does not give loans to the farmers po. Mayroon tayong one half of one percent penalties. Na ngayon po ay nandyan na sa pill guarantee na hindi natin alam po kung saan sila na gagaranti sa housing ba or sa uh, iba bang project aside from co-op, aside from agriculture po. So, Oo, may ito sa file na rin ako na resolution tungkol sa Agri-Agra na iniimbestigan nga saan napupunta lahat ng mga loans na yan, pati yung mga penalty kung saan napupunta. Kasi nagugulat lang tayo bakit uh, bilyon-bilyon ang pinag-uusapan. Wala namang pinapautang yung fill guarantee at hindi naman dinedeklara ng uh, PCIC. Nakakagulat yung dinedeklara nila yun. Nasa GAA na 3 billion. Yun pala, meron rin pala silang malaki doon sa Agri-Agra. Yeah, mabagat na yung ginawa mo, ma'am, kasi that will more or less give us transparency kung saan na nangyari ng funding na yun. Napakalaki yun, ma'am. Sana that will be used for guarantees of the farmers' projects, no? Para ma-forward talaga natin yung development at saka empowerment ng farmers po. Ang mahirap pa dyan, engineer, ang mahirap pa dyan, Aside from the large amount of money that uh, is unaccounted for, doon sa policy making at saka sa management, palagay ko wala namang magsasaka sa pill guarantee. Uh, yeah, yan ang very uh, sad reality. So, uh, kaya hindi nga natin malaman talaga kasi structural policy shift nga ang kailangan natin. Eh. We need to understand that uh, this is an urgent uh, matter. 
Kasi kung sinasabi natin, ma'am, uh, price stability, we can never achieve price stability if we do not have post-harvest facility and storage po. Kasi dalawa lang po ang cropping ng mais po. Ang first cropping is the wheat season cropping, yung maulan. Yun, yung cropping na yun, ma'am, yun ang bumper harvest which, which represents 65% of the volume that will right. supply you for the next seven months of the one year. The second cropping... So, talaga may post-harvest. Yeah, uh, the second cropping, ma'am, will supply you uh, the five months uh, cropping which is the dry season crop, no? So that right. will complete the cycle of the 12 months. Now, without the post-harvest facility, you can never guarantee the quality of corn in the next four, five months later of the harvest. Kaya yun ang kailangan natin, ma'am, ang infrastructure. Ang problema, ma'am, walang targeting system yung ating DA, no? Uh, the corn program. For example, uh, in the next five years, if one president... Sa DA, can... sino ngayon ang in-charge sa corn, ba? Uh, Baka yeah. sa Senator Pangilinan, matulungan tayo kasi... Hindi ko na alam kung sino yung nagse-set ng target sa DA. Uh, marami sila, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> kaya kaya nga yun ang problema, ma'am, kasi ang KPI kasi nila, ma'am, is more expenditures of budget. It's not more on how many do we need. Uh, for example, in the corn, let's just assume, ma'am, that we should be able to sequester the 30% or 20% harvest during the wheat season crop so that this 30% or 20% will equalize the prices and supply and therefore render uh, stability of prices and supply and guarantee farmers' income po. So, yun, yun yung target namin sana po. Kung sana magiging uh, ano tong uh, structural policy. So, yun lang yung mga... Gusto namin maano ma'am sa iyo para structural talaga na <laughs> big time sige Well well ang, ang marami pa kasi maliliit ma'am pero talagang ito sana ang magandang magawa kasi we can if there is no infrastructure support this is public good ma'am di ba Just like oh, building man. a hospital this is just building a bridge no this is just like building a school Without the post-harvest facility, ma'am, pabalik-balik ang problema namin, ma'am. Next year, ganun pa rin yung sabihin namin. Next year, ganun pa rin. So, wala talagang, wala talagang katapusan, ma'am. Sorry to say this. It's true. Amen. Unfortunately, you're absolutely right. Um, is there anyone else who'd like uh, to speak? I think we have the cattle racers. We have Anago from the Agricultural Co-op. Is there uh, anyone who'd like to come forward and represent their sector? Thank you very much, Engineer Navarro. Po. Or nanjam ba yung uh, Joseph Gotero para tuloy tuloy tayo sa Grecon? Kasi nasa grains palin tayo. Secretary, Secbeth. Ma'am, pwede pa isa? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, sige, hear it pa. <laughs> Uh, Hirit lang ito, ma'am. Kasi, uh, di ba, nung nag-sign uh, up tayo with WTO, ma'am, corn industry has never been uh, allowed to export, no? Hello, sir. We, we, we have allowed ourselves or the country allowed importation of corn and corn substitute, no? That's but right. We are not allowed to export our corn. This Correct. time around with the structural policy po, we wanted to export, no? Uh, for corn, of course, with the post-harvest facility. Uh, just to equalize the bumper harvest during the wheat season crop. And then uh, in the dry season crop, when there is no corn, we should be we allowed can import. To, Yeah, we can import at the same volume that we exported at zero tariff, po, just to equalize the, the supply. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, but kasi yun talaga mga policy na dapat makikita natin. Kasi parang ano yan, may may parang uh, uh, tinatawag natin game theory, hindi yung competitive advantage po. No? So kailangan kasi yan ang ginagawa ng ibang bansa, eh dapat gagawin din natin, ma'am, kung pwede. Okay. So Thank you very much, Engineer Navarro. Who is that? That's uh, Senator Nandiyan na po si Ms. Anago. Hi, hi. Hello. Welcome and thank you very much for participating. Ang ating kinatawan na nagkaisang magsasaka ng Isabela Agrico at ang chairwoman po natin si Anago. You're recognized pa. Uh, Nakamute po kayo, hindi marinig. Okay, on lang ng audio. 
Pastor. Good morning. Ayan, ayan. Okay, game. Ganda-ganda pa rin. Beautiful pa rin ang aming senador. Maraming salamat. Thank you for coming. Yes, madam. What well, else could be of help para po sa inyo? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, we'd like to know sa mga agri-coop natin, may na itutulong ba yung ating DA, yung CDA, yung iba't ibang uh, government agencies? May na avail ba kayo? Ayon. Yes, madam. Yung pong nagamit namin ngayon yung sa RCEF. Ah, uh, doon po yung Rice Comprehensive Enhancement Fund na uh, 10 billion. But then yung pong dapat na loan sa ating mga farmers na ang ginawa po ni Governor was to put up a cooperative, Governor Albano, was to put up a cooperative, but ako po yung kanyang pinang-chair. And this, ang instead na ipautang, ang ginawa na lang po niya is that uh, premium price ang pagbili ng palay. Kasi kung papautang, mahirap maningil. Sabi niya, mauubos lang yung funds na walang mangyayari. Oo, ako so, nagsabi sa kanya, sabi ko, mas maganda mag-buyback kesa sa magpautang. Ah, kayo sa idea nyo pala yun. Eh, kasi matagal na namin ginagawa sa palay at sa, at sa kabawang sa Ilocos Norte. Purus buyback kami. Ah, no wonder. At napakaganda naman, ano ano? madam, ang nangyari. So, uh, definitely chicken, plus 5 pesos po ang ginawa ni Governor. Uh, Nung time na pata ang presyo. Chicken, chicken, para mahawa ka. Chicken, two-piece chicken rice. Two-piece chicken rice. Gutom na si Sendo. Ayan. Manok na pinapusapan. Manok na pinapusapan, madam sir. Dapat may catering sa lahat. Daya ninyo, ha? O sige, Ana, please proceed. Sendo, hindi mo, ha? Ang oh, yes. kinugutom kami. So, Ana, meron kayong co-op, tapos the buyback plus 5 pesos kada kilo? So, sa lahat po ng mga ano. Pero right now na mataas ang presyo, hindi, nagdagdag lang kami ng piso or 50 cents. That's right. Lang. So, kasi napakataas po ng presyo ngayon ng palay. And then, but then, and ang problema lang, I really cannot, ano, hindi ko po kaya accommodate lahat. That's why we really have to stop. Kasi nagiging problema. Oo. Yung ano, te takers naman. Saan naman naman ibibenta yung aming bigas? Eh kaya nga, right. kung ganda nga sana kung kaming mga co-ops or ating mga cooperative ay matulungan. Di ba, ang dami naman po mga rice allowances ng ating mga government. Ano na eh. Is in Yun form of rice na lang ni sa... Si Senator Pangilinan, narito eh. Siya una nagtulak niya ng direct buying from the farmers, di ba? Sa yes. ating uh, programa. And also, uh, pinipilit rin namin yung DSWD, yung rice allowance, pati yung mga pulis, yung mga sundalo. Ang dami naman kumakain ng bigas, lahat naman ng Pilipino. Ayun, so... That's right. Madam Sir. Sure. Senator Pangilinan, siya na una riyan. Pwede natin, ma'am, uh, pagtulungan for the 2022 budget because that's already in the 2021 budget na direct purchases ng DSWD, DILG, uh, DOH, uh, uh, debt ed. So, when we computed it, uh, lumalabas yung budget sila for feeding, relief operations, uh, livelihood, etc. na may food component or agriculture uh, purchases component. Ang estimate for 2020 is around 41 billion. Eh. Uh, 2021. 41 billion. Hindi pa kasama yung LGUs. So, maybe we can, uh, with the help of the chair of the Economic Affairs Committee, i I-tiyakin natin na number one, uh, hilingin natin uh, ano ang naging output nila for uh, for the 2021 in terms of direct purchases sa mga kooperatiba na accredited. Ulang um, pa rin! Uh -huh, mahina. Uh, kinakailangan pang itulak ng husto. Although I, I understand yung nagkakaisang magsasaka ng Isabella was able to sell directly sa mga LGUs nung lockdown last year. So... Kahit paano, eh, yung 6 million kilos of rice nila uh, ay naipamahagi nila. Ang problema ngayon, na-spoil yung ating mga lockdown uh, communities. Hinahanap ngayon yung Isabella rice na, na malagkit at uh, oh, matamo. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> totoo yan. At uh, eto nga, um, nag-digitize na ba kayo? Kasi dito sa Ilocos Norte, nagbebenta kami online eh. Dahil ang hirap-hirap nga. Hindi, madam. Hindi pa kami nag, ano, actually, ang... Isabella Rice, may pangalan na siya. I-online na ninyo. 
Tulungan, kasi, tulungan tayo. Kasi we really need people to, you know, we have to, um, ano na naman kami, mag, kailangan talaga meron kami mga tao na magde-deliver at tao magmamanage niyan. Tulong tulong And tayo then, dyan kasi uh, nakalagay na yun ng uh, kadiwa dyan sa DA, obligasyon nila pati yung truck. Dapat sila ang mag-pick up sa, sa ating farm gate. At uh, dito, well, hinahalimbawa ko lang si Governor Matthew dito sa amin, nagbebenta, siya yung nagbebenta online hanggang abokado siya, parin nagbebenta, lahat binibenta, mango, ala binibenta, nagumpisa sa bawang at uh, palay ngayon, binibenta niya online, pati mangga at uh, abokado. Maganda nga yan, madam. Napakaganda po niyan kung talagang matutuloy yung online selling. But, you know, kasi alam nyo naman, hindi rin, yung, kasi that would be more on retailing. That's And right. Maganda po niyan kung may bibigay natin yan sa mga as livelihood sa retailing. But then, ang ano kasi namin, um, kung pwede, nandun kami sa wholesale or bulk uh, selling because bulk din po kasi pag dumating ang palay, we really need Uh-oh. na importan yung farmers doing harvest season. Sa dami ng palay sa Isabela, pa, paano pa ninyo na i-story yan? Sa bodega pa lang, gulang na, putok na, putok na. <laughs> Hindi naman po, at least ano po, napakakailangan. Kaya lang kasi, since we buy at a higher price, may premium right. price, that's why, mahirap makipag-compete sa presyo because we have uh, mataas ang aming cost. At the same time, pero ang kagandahan naman, at least yung mga this Nak meron na rin po kaming rice meal ngayon. And okay. ang, ang ang ano to, ang kagandahan lang po, it is owned by the farmers. At sa kanila to. So whatever na ano, hindi hindi siya profit oriented na kailangan na kung bumagsak ang presyo, kailangan ibagsak din namin ang presyo ng pagbili ng palay because para tumas ang kita, hindi naman po yung goal. Ang goal is that whatever ko ano man po yung presyo, eh right. hindi na mababa talaga ang presyo ng bigas sa totoo lang. That's why hindi namin kailangan ibagsak ang presyo ng palay, especially in buying sa mga, directly sa ating mga members or mga farmers. I, have, lang, you know, I have a question. Uh, mga ano, no? uh, bakit RCEF lang ang nararamdaman ninyo? Samantalang may regular rice program naman na billion-billion din sa DA. Di ba sila nakakatulong? Kasi yung RCEP, puro inbred lang yon Eh yung hybrid, fertilizer, at iba pa, lahat nasa regular rice program ng DA. Hindi ba dumadating sa Isabela yon Dumarating din naman, madam. Kaya lang, di ba, in form of fertilizer, di ba, ganun hmm. lang naman yon Or uh, nagkakaroon ng ayuda. Hybrid. Kaya nga, tapos meron naman. Kaya nga sabi ko, kahit na yung mga fertilizer na yun, kung pwede, wala na. Huwag na kayo mamigay ng libre. Kung pwede yung pondo na ginagamit sa paglibre uh, na fertilizer. Bigay na lang yung cash kasi oh, ang nangyayari, price na lang. Wal, walang fer- nawawala yung fertilizer, yung scam ang na, uh, na, natitira. <laughs> Hindi lang yun, madam. It's so happen kasi kung minsan, pag yung fertilizer, darating na siya late na. Hindi mm. na nila kailangan. Tama. So, Tapos Or else, maling klase. Oh, yung maling tapos, klase, yung, oh, yung siyempre yun 14, eh, talagang tapos huling na. huli na. <laughs> Tama po yun. Kaya it, I think it is best na ibigay, bayan na lang yung farmers. Kung pwede, ang government na lang bumili ng fertilizer at ibili, ibenta ng mura. Kasi basta kumikita ang farmers, basta bilhin lang ng palay nila sa mataas na presyo, I'm sure. Pag kumita po sila, they don't mind buying Uh, Oo naman. Oo oh, naman. Thank you very much. So, meron rin kayong uh, regular. Okay, thanks very much. At hindi pa kayo nag-embark sa online um, dahil nga may komplikasyon. So, may komplikasyon din talaga yung online eh. Kailangan may delivery. Pero, yeah. makikipag, uh, makikipag uh, deal lang naman. Makikipag partner naman kayo niyan eh. That's how it works eh. Pero may yeah. bodega rin sa mga. Kaya matulungan kami sa mga ano namin. Magbobodega. Uh, mag- ang kailangan niyan, magbobodega ka sa Manila tapos may kadil na delivery service kaya. Yeah. Naging expert na si, yung anak ko, si Buridex na yun. Expert na siya magbenta ng kung ano-ano. <laughs> Okay. Uh, si, si Grecon, nandiyan ba? Si Mr. Gotero? 
Andiyan ba? Thank you very much, Chair Ana. Kung may maisip pa kayo, dagdag natin. Baka sakali maka, makadali tayo. Yes, Madam. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you. My best to your Governor. Yes, Madam. Yes, uh, Comsec. Nandiyan ba yung iba? Sino pang ready dyan? The Federation of Cattle, Cattle Racers. Ayan, di pa namin na naririnig din yan. Represented po sila ni Mr. Billy Badilla. Okay, who's ready to uh, who's ready to come forward, please? Senator si ano si Mr. Joey Paustino na koko na industry reform. Yeah, pero kung maare parin tita may shadow magulo yung Grecon, please. Anjam ba? Oh, hindi na. Oh, kasi grain retailers, para isang pag-usapan, nag nagsimula tayo mais, naging rice, ano ngayon yung Grecon? Nandito po, nakalagin pa po siya, Senator. Okay, can you invite uh, the uh, Grecon representative to please give us a profile of your industry and the government interventions um, that you require? Wala na yung Grecon? Okay, kung wala na yung Grecon, sino pa ang matatawag natin? Uh, Comsec, please. Senator, kayo na lang dyan po si Mr. Joey Paustino ng Coconut Industry Reform. Okay, okay. Thank you. But uh, nag-e-echo nag ka. I think your audio is very poor, uh, Comsec. Please uh, check. Yes, we recognize Mr. Faustino of uh, Coir. Yes, magandang tanghali na po. Sa o ating... nga, tanghali na. Madam Kung suyan sa kumiting to, uh, hindi nagpapakain uh, ng tao. Inaasahan ko sana yung, yung iba pa sa agricultural sector na mauna din dahil mas mga burning issues sila. However, uh, Medyo burning issues rin kayo kasi may coco levy na dapat. Opo. Uh, well, isa ho sa malaking concern namin yon at magiging recommendation namin na yung kapapasa ho nung mid-March, well, effectively mid-March, yes. uh, 11524, this is the Coconut Farmers and Industry uh, Trust Fund Act, no? ay uh, pagamit o ma-implement ng todo. Kasi ang Lagi ho namin sinasabing pagsusuri ay ito nga ang COVID pandemic, pinakita lang niya yung matagal ng ills ng ating sistema no at na nabaon lalo yung mga coconut farmers natin, yung mga tunay na coconut farmers po na nagihirap uh, uh, with their families, they compose around one-fourth ng ating population. Um, concern lang po namin, well, una hindi kami masyadong naging uh, maligaya dun sa, sa kinalabasan ng itong batas na uh, ipinasa. Uh, pero gay gayon pa man, handa kami at ginagawa namin na nag engage ngayon with the Philippine Coconut Authority para maitama yung ilang, ano, yung ilang aspects nito. Dediretsoin ko na ho agad doon sa 11524. Gusto lang po namin makita na ang kalakhan ng resources na ito, dahil ito naman ay sa totoo lang uh, pag-aari ng mga magniniyog. No, yes, that's right. Uh, itatanong ko lang, you're referring to the, the bill that just got passed. As you know, it's a subject of decades upon decades of uh, uh, legal cases at uh, compromise, talagang uh, maraming depekto. Alin yung pinaka-problematic para sa tropa ninyo? Na ah, may... talagang tugunan kagad. Ah, talagang tugunan kagad. Parang, ano ho eh, uh, kung tutugunan, it would require an amendment. No, of, of, Pero medyo uh, mahirap-hirap mag-amend kagad, katatapos correct. lang. Alam po namin yun. Kaya nga, pinipilit na... Pinipilit namin ni engage ang PCA para sa isang favorable interpretation of the law. Uh, kunyari po, uh, yung pagmamaneho ng pondo, ang sabi ko ng mga mambabatas, eh, wala namang alam 
sa kaperahan ang mga magninyog, kaya bahala na ang gobyerno magmaneho nitong pondong ito. Uh, hindi naman ho sinabi nung batas na hindi ka pwedeng makialam. <laughs> so nandun kami sa sa nakikialam. Wala kami dun sa Hindi sa, lang oh, kayo sige. ang nahirapan, hindi lang kayo ang nahirapan sa provision na 'yon. Ah, uh, medyo pinagsabihan at nabito ng dalawang beses dahil sa provision na 'yon kung sino magma-manage and hold in trust nitong trust fund. 'Yun ang problema. Oh, Naka ilang beses pa balik-balik hirap na hirap si Senator Villar nung bandang huli para lang maipasa. Ayan, medyo medyo kailangan nga ng uh, very uh, perceptive and enlightened interpretation para mabuhay. Correct, natin. correct Madam Chair. Kaya nga ganun po ang attitude namin, di man kami maligaya, ay eh, ini-engage pa rin namin ang pamahalaan. Pangalawa pong provision doon ay eh, yung paghahati-hati ng pondo sa iba't ibang ahensya ng mga ng gobyerno. Uh, nawala yata si Senator Marcos. No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm okay. I'm just here. Uh -oh. Opo. I'm Yun po. May, may konting problema din kami doon kung paano i-interpret naman yung pondo na pinaghati-hati sa iba't ibang opisina. Ano? Siguro, you know, what you can do is um, ang, kung maari, just write it down and uh, if uh, you have a chance, kung ano yung recommended ninyo, of course, hindi naman natin makukuha, pero like you said, baka sakali naman sa implementation, gumanda ng kaunti. Yeah, I think we're doing better than that, Senator, kasi what we're doing is um, be with the PCA in yes. implementation okay. para lang masigurado na ang lahat, ang kalakhano ng pondo talaga ay mapunta doon sa mga komunidad. Kasi matagal na naman namin sinasabi. Kunyari, ngayon, ang posting po ng presyo ng Copra is at 38 to 40 pesos per What? kilo. Wasto ba yan? 38 to 40 sa summer? Ang baba-baba sa amin? Well, you know, ang nakapost nila. Pero alam din naman natin na hindi naman presyo ng Copra yung, yung solusyon dito sa napakalaking problema na ito. Kung hindi na maiaho natin yung mga magnyonyog talaga sa pagiging raw material suppliers lamang. Um, in fact, pag naririnig ko po yung iba sa agricultural sector, ano, um, pag tinitignan nyo kasi yung, yung coconut sector, malaki ho yung, yung effect nito sa iba pang agricultural sector at saka sa ibang industrial sector. Kung gagamitin lang natin ng, ng tama. We were dialoguing with... Um, The NDA, the National Dairy Authority, care of the PCA, kailangan ko naman pasalamatan yung Philippine Coconut Authority Administration today na nakikinig naman ano? at hinahayaan kami na mag-input para dun sa industry plan na mandato ng inyong batas. Uh, uh, sila po ay, ay dairy, yung kanilang inaasikaso, baka, ganyan, para sa mga magsasaka. Ngunit hindi nila oh, alam. Ako yan, naglagay ng plan, plan na yan eh. <laughs> Opo. Pero, pero hindi ho nila pa rin sila updated na nakakagawa ka ng non-dairy milk mula ho sa niyog. That's right. Uh, Oo. And, and so, in, in, napapabayaan. At saka ako lahat ng non-dairy milk. Oo, napapabayaan ho itong aspetong to. Ang isa hong importante na makakatulong talaga na kailangan namin hilingin sa inyo ngayon ay yung binabanggito ni Senator Kiko tsaka ninyo kanina, yung direct buying nung, yeah. nung gobyerno. Yeah. Kasi kung yung kaperahan ho sana na 11.524 is making available ay madadala sa komunidad at uh, ma-equip -e sila para makagawa ng uh, value chain added, added products from the nyog. Ano? Uh, Malaki ho yung papel ng direct buying ng gobyerno uh, para maiahon no ito. Parang two birds with one stone, di ba? Gumamit ka ng pera, tinulungan mo yung magsasaka para kumita, binili mo yung, yung kanyang produkto at ginamit mo naman sa iyong feeding program. Uh, ngayon no, ang virgin coconut oil, nilabas na nila yung pag-aaral na ito indeed ay nakakatulong dito sa sa pag-prevent at pag-handle ng COVID cases. Uh, they made it formal two days ago, yung study na ito. Pero ang epekto nito, 
yung ating virgin coconut oil dahil nababalitaan na to ng mundo ay lahat na naman o ang malaking parte ay mapupunta sa exportation. Samantalang yung mga sarili nating magninyog na mga naghihirap, di ba, that cannot afford hospitalization and curative measures against COVID, nasa kanila yung raw material but they don't have the virgin coconut oil. So, kung, kung sana talaga ma-concentrate lang natin yung bagong batas na yan, patungo dun sa komunidad, no? at ma- mapaikot yan, pati yung local economies ng mga komunidad. Kasi pag, nag-res- pag tumindi ho ang restriction, kunyari, nagsara yung manufacturing sector, tigil ho lahat ng pagbibili ng, ng nyog. Yeah, In fact, kaya mataas ang presyo ngayon dahil nga may konti kang glap sa sa international market. That's right. Diba? Kaya lang mataas ang presyo. Pero pag nag-regularize ulit yan, bababa na naman yan. So kailangan po natin talaga makoncentrate ito. Um, the law says that um, itong projects in 11.524 should report to the Office of the President and COCAFAM. Uh, yung legislative side. I think Mahalaga ho na ang indicator na gawin ay kung ano ang nangyari sa komunidad at magkano ang idinadagdag sa value. no? Hindi lang ho income. Kasi yung income ng coconut farmer, pag tumaas ang presyo, sabihin po ng pamahalaan, tumaas na ang income. Pagka tumaas ang produksyon ng copra, sabihin, tumaas ang income. Pero hindi naman ho yun yung katunayan. So the indicator should really be um, ano ho yung nadagdag? No? Value addition dun sa produkto ng mga magninyog and therefore nagtaas yung kita nila dahil dun. Oh. Um, at pati na rin ngayon dahil sa COVID pandemic, we should be monitoring uh, yung health benefits that our coconuts can do. You were talking about rice, Senator, and how it feeds the country. The coconuts, your coconuts can feed the country also. So, Pero tingnan nyo naman ang budget, di ba? Parang 27 billion yata sa rice, pero 1 billion sa coconut. Ang laki-laki ho nung disparity. Grabe, diba? at saka yung uh, kung tutuusin, the numbers uh, of farmers and farming families involved, rice to coconut. Pa- are much larger. Kaya nga, ano ba yan? Hindi po ba? So yun, yun po, yun ang kailangan namin sa inyo right now is to help us no, as we engage government uh, implementation, that all of these resources should be concentrated to the community level. Malabo po kasi sa batas eh. Sa batas, oh. parang pwedeng gamitin para dun sa mga ano eh, sa mga industry projects, research, etc. Na wala naman hong direktang beneficyo talaga dun sa magninyog. So pinipilit po namin sa choir coconut industry reform movement kasama yung kilusang magninyog iba't ibang uh, federation po ng mga mga magninyog na organisasyon ay eh, talaga hong pinipilit namin yung interpretation to be like so in fact pati nga po yung simpleng registration naging issue na eh kasi magulo PCA... magulo yung listahan ng coconut farmers laban laban okay. and PCA wanted a new Sabi namin, you cannot finish it in 90 days. Di ba? Dapat, okay, dapat. Yan, pagulo yan. Alam ko po, and uh, I hear you, I hear you, uh, uh, Mr. Faustino. Kasi ang, uh, syempre, ang uh, ang kan namin sa nanay ko, eh puro magnunyog sa Leyte at Samar. At talagang napakahirap ng buhay nila kung tutuusin. Kahit ihambing mo sa nagbibigas, eh talagang mas mabigat. Eh, yung, yung sa provision po kasi ng batas, Nakalagay, PCA should finish the list in 90 days. Eh sabi namin, teka muna, registration yan eh. They come and go. May nabubuhay, may namamatay. So hindi una tatapos yung registration na yan. Dapat yan ay bukas sa lahat. At pag may na-encuentro ang PCA in the process of implementing na hindi registrado, hindi dapat yun, uh, hindi dapat i-disown na. Hindi ka registrado eh. So sorry ka na lang. Diba? Dapat to. Oh, so inclusive. Ah, hindi ka registrado, so i-register ka. G- ganun yung interpretation, so na kailangan naming um, i- Medyo madugo i- talaga yung registration kung sino yung mga beneficiary. Diyan nagkaka-away-away eh. Pati sa ayuda ngayon, di ba, sa DSWD, talaga nagkakagulo sa registration. 
Correct, uh, Madam Chair. Kaya ka, kailangan we have to keep it open. And it's That's logical correct. that way. It's logical that way. Diba? Pati nga ho sa nomination sa PCA board eh. Gumawa ng sariling process yung PCA para dun sa inonominate nila. Eh sabi namin, teka muna, may batas kang magna carta for small coconut farmers where where any um, association or people's organization ng mga farmers uh, meeting the require the legal requirements can actually nominate. So dapat niyo po tanggapin yun at hindi i-limit lang dun sa inyong interpretation of the law. Ganito po yung aming uh, ano thank you, thank you. Thank you very much at uh, natutuwa naman ako na kahit maraming sakit ng ulo, pursigido pa rin kayo na talaga ma-implemento kasi ang tagal-tagal na nating inaantay to, ang dami na ng bulilyaso na vito-vito pa, kaya let's make it work po. Let's give it a chance. Maraming salamat well, for coming. Well, yes. And if you'd like to submit something, uh, in addition to what you said, which are uh, all noted, Abay, uh, I'd be very, very happy to receive them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gutera, ready na po kayo? Mr. Joseph Gutera, are you ready? O sino ang nandyan? Yeah, cattle racers, Martin Gomez, nandyan po ba? Senator, parang wala na po yung mga agriculture, parang nag- nag Nagutam na yata pati sila. si Sento kasi nag-order na ng pagkain eh. <laughs> Oo nga po. Uh, tinawa, tinatawagan ko po sila isa-isa. Alright, who's, uh, who's still... Haulers na po tayo. Alright, let's go to Mr. Ted Hervasio. Ay, ano po na po si Mr. Gotera. Ayan po yung Ayan order niya. Okay. Opo. Mr. Gotera, ginutom na yata namin kayo. Teka, ikaw ba? Yes, uh, Madam Gutera. Senator, I'm uh, sorry I have a connection problem here uh, in Capiz. Uh, I was asked by Vice Governor um, James uh, Magbanwa to represent him in this uh, webinar. But uh, I'm very sorry, Senator, but I don't have here with me um, data or figures. No, uh, no problem. Guys, uh, I would just like you to... Uh... I would just like you to uh, submit na lang a position paper or a letter uh, just explaining uh, what programs of the government have actually worked for you at ano pa yung kailangan ninyo. Please tell Vice Gov na lang. Yes, Madam uh, Senator, we'll do, we'll do um, forward you our position, our position uh, uh, Madam Senator. Yeah, I haven't seen the Escolins and my other relatives in Capiz in a long, long time. But uh, um, uh, certainly my best regards to everyone. Uh, please uh, please submit na lang on behalf of Grecon. Yes, uh, uh, Madam Senator. Thank you very much, Madam Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gotera. Maraming salamat. Kung... Thank you, Madam Senator. Ma'am Beth? Yes po. Uh, proceed na tayo sa ano? Sa Haulers and Trucks Association. Nandito pa yung ano? Nandito pa si Mr. Ted Herbacio at saka si Miss Mary Zapata. Ayan, oo. Nareceive ko yung inyong mga yung mga position paper. Maraming salamat. Nabasa ko. Ang dami. Ang komplikado eh. Ang daming problema. Anyways, um, sino mauna? Senator, mga nakalag-in pa po sila pero hindi ko po alam kung andyan pa sila talaga physically because nobody is answering me. Alright, si that's fine. Sapata, si Mr. Dino, 
si That's Mr. Okay. Magneto. Actually, uh, Miss Zapata uh, has uh, a, a very long list and um, a, a very uh, comprehensive briefer. Yung sa truckers, um, yes. who else uh, can we talk to? Anjali. Na, nandito ah, na pala, si pala, Manyebo. Na sila. Mr. Manyebo. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, Madam good Chair. Afternoon. Sino mauna? Mr. Hervasio po. Okay. okay, sige. Thank you. Mr. Hervasio, kayo na daw mauna. Wala raw ladies first dito. Kayo daw muna. <laughs> na, Nakamute po kayo, Nakamute sir. Nakamute po yung audio ninyo. Hindi ko kayo mari. Ayun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ayan, good afternoon okay. po, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to everybody. Una po ay uh, nagpapasalamat ang aming sektor for uh, having here in your hearing. And uh, totoo po na napakaraming problema nitong aming sektor uh, even before the start of the pandemic. But uh, ang uh, sa amin po from the pandemic uh, uh, period, uh, na-experience po namin at the start yung... Uh, problema sa mga checkpoint but this was addressed by um, IATF yun pong uh, pagsaset nila ng mga protocols and uh, naklaro naman po but as we go we go along 14 uh, 14 months ay na experience pa rin po natin yung uh, inconsistent implementation of uh, protocols by different LGUs kasi po we are moving nationwide ang ang franchise po ng mga trucker ngayon ay from your point of operation to any point in the Philippines. Kaya po ganun yung ganun po yung uh, nagiging galaw namin. Oh, ay uh, ang reklamang naririnig namin sa iba't ibang sektor pati yung mga mga bus, mga jeep, iba-iba uh, ang uh, mga requirements sa iba't ibang LGU hindi ata na ako coordinate. Yun po, yun po yung uh, nagiging problema namin. Eh, sa ngayon ay... Meron silang pati, sinasabi, pati LTFRB at IATF, minsan iba yung protocol, hindi rin nagkakatugma. Actually, nandun po sa concerns po natin ngayon na i-re-raise ko sa inyo. So, doon po, po sa punta ng LGU, sa ngayon yung mga testings na lang ang hinahanap nila, may, wala na po yung rapid test but uh, some are requiring uh, uh, swab test or... Uh, yung ating uh, yung gen test especially po if we are coming from the bubble tapos lalabas po kami yun yung uh, hinahanap po nila ay eh, hindi naman po kami nakakapagpagawa nakakapagpa-test ng uh, ganun kadalas kasi may cost din po no and uh, we have uh, oh nga unfortunately ang daming nahaharang dito sa Ilocos Norte na galing sa NCR <laughs> masyado strict pa kami rito <laughs> So, yun po, yun po yung isang concern namin. And of course, uh, it costs delays. Kung wala pong ganun, uh, it's good na yung ating, uh, yung ating uh, communication system, kung minsan nagkakaintindihan over the phone, but uh, meron pong pagkakataon talaga na hindi kami nakakatuloy do sa pagbiyahe uh, dahil yun po yung hinahanap. And uh, ganun din po doon sa aming mga clients na naghahanap din ng mga testing. So, of course, meron po tayong, meron po silang kanilang implementasyon just to protect themselves na pag pumasok yung tao namin, drivers and helpers, uh, as we all know, ang amin lang pong hawak ay simpleng face mask at saka po isang boteng alcohol o minsan po may face shield. Yun lang po ang pwede naming dadalhin. Uh, we cannot Marami bang nawalan na trabaho? Marami bang nabakanting mga howler at saka tracker dahil sa lockdown? Marami din po. Bagamat sabi nga natin, unhampered movement of goods. Pero may classification din po tayo. Yung Kasi nga may classification. Diba meron essential yung mga agri at saka medical. May priority lane. Tapos yung iba hinarang din. Um, what did you experience in terms of demand in terms of traffic nung lockdown. Siyempre, nabawasan yun, ano? At may ibang nawalan ng trabaho. Mayroon po. Marami pong ganun. Kasi yun pong mga hindi essential, like construction materials, nung, nung kasagsagan po nung pandemic last year, ay hindi po ito na-allow. Yung ating mga dump truck operators ay hindi. That's right. Po. 
So yun po yung nangyayari. Karamihan po dito yung ating mga port, uh, port trackers kasi yun po ating imports and exports and uh, yung mga domestic cargoes. Yan po ay naaalaw na naman. So kaya marami rin po yung mga companies na hindi nag-operate dahil nga po hindi sila mga essentials. Kaya yung mga, mga trackers na nag-move for them ay nasa garahe lang din po. Hindi rin sila naka, nakabiyahe. So maganda lang po kayo na na-open na ulit. No? And uh, yun po going back doon sa problema namin with, with uh, some of the clients na naghahanap ng mga mga swab tests at uh, saka ibang testings, doon po kami konting uh, naapektuhan. Uh, it's good na yung iba po ay simple barangay certificate, health certificate ay, ay ina-accept po yun. No? Doon sa, uh, doon... sa grupo ninyo, meron bang mga kumpanyang nagsara or uh, hindi na kayang uh, mag-umpisa ulit? Meron po ma'am kasi Or tuloy-tuloy lang Yun po ibang hindi nakabiyahe Tapos mayroong mga amortizations Yun na nga, uh, hihilakin yung truck nila Yes, na, na, nabawi na po na, na Nakuha na yung mga trucks nila Yung iba hindi naman nila masustain yung, uh, yung mga overhead expenses Dahil wala naman po talagang biyahe So they opted to, to close shop for a while Sinoli nila yung mga trucks yung mga drivers ay, uh, well, sinabihan na po na maghanap na lang muna ng ibang trabaho dahil wala po talagang galawan. Ay, yun po yung uh, na-experience natin. And, uh, Pero palabi uh, bang unemployed sa tropa ninyo, hindi naman masyadong maraming nawala ng trabaho? Well, I would say mga 40% po siguro yung hindi hindi nakabiyahe. Yung Up to now? Ngayon, opo, yung gumagalaw po ngayon, yung iba on and off. Kasi hindi pa rin ganun kalakas yung biyahe so, na... Ang, ang na, sinasabi ninyo, ang, uh, ang, uh, ang howling ngayon, nasa 60% pa lang, 40% eh, talagang wala pa? Opo, sa transport po, no? sa transport. Uh, yun pong 40% ay naapektuhan ng... Uh, ng ang dami pong, ano, ang dami pong reasons. No? Uh, yes. Isa, isa na rito yung uh, binabanggit yung kangina na, na franchise. Kasi po ay, uh, ay uh, naapektuhan na kami ngayon noong year model phase-out. Kung kayo po ay, uh, ay uh, familiar doon sa year model phase-out. Uh, ay pahagi ba yan ng modernization ng DOTR? Yes po, yun yung modernization sa transport yeah. as yeah. a whole. But uh, in, in, in terms of trucks, ay uh, nagkaintindihan po kami that it should be roadworthiness for the trucks. Kasi po, ang naging comparison nila between the bus and the trucks, kasi nag-require sila ng brand new sa buses. Oh, oh. Ang justification po namin dito, buses coming from Fairview going to San Pedro, Laguna, tumatakbo po sila ng almost 50 kilometers one way. So, yung po round trip is 100 kilometers, tatlong biyay sa isang araw, that's 300 kilometers per day. We're asked kami po sa truck from the port Sabihin na lang po natin na maximum na 50 kilometers yung tinakbo namin. Tapos pabalik another 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers per day. Hindi pa po, hindi pa po araw-araw nakakabiyahe yun. So yung comparison nila na, na year model against sa roadworthiness, malaki po yung defense. But it's good na nag-agree na po ang uh, LTO, ang LTFRB, ang DOT, DOTR that it should really be roadworthiness na maging basis nung uh, approval ng ating mga trucks on the road. Kaya lang po sa ngayon, may kalituhan pa rin kasi when we when we uh, re renew or apply for extension of validity ng ating mga franchises, yung pong mga 15 years old na lumilitaw, hindi na po nila ina-accept. So, talaga pong masasideline itong mga truck. And at this point in time, kaya hindi na pinag-uusapan natin yung mga loans, loans, eh, kung mangungutang ka ng truck ngayon at wala ka naman po ganun kalakas na biyahe, eh, wa, wa, hindi po business yung pinupunta natin. Talagang ang gastos lang. So yun po yung, <laughs> yun po yung isang uh, ipinag-uusap namin sa inyo na baka po pwede siya nang uh, ma-concretize na yung po concern about roadworthiness. 
okay. na maging basis ng ating mga trucks. Kasi may problema pa rin po tayo doon sa issue ng MBIC for trucks. Oh, oh. Hindi pa rin po na, 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 na iayos yun. So kaya po ganun. And then, dahil nga po dito sa, sa pandemic, on and off yung ating mga government offices like LTO, LTFRV, um, meron po mga concerns about renewal of registrations, renewal of driver's license, na yeah. uh, uh, ang nangyayari po, eh, nag-extend naman ng LTO, nag-extend ng LTFRB, uh, gusto ko lang po pala ano masalaman tayo. Pare? LTF, we would like to take uh, LTFRB po, no? Uh, in-extend po nila yung aming provision at authority from 90 days to one year. So malaking tulong po ito. But just the same, Ang nangyayari po ma'am, yung implementation na gano, oh, yun yung uh, incongruent right. implementation oh. ng, ng LGU rules no, against uh, national policies and regulation. Um, nakuhuli po kami sa kalsada, expired ang provisional authority, hinuhuli kami ng local government. Hindi naman naiintindihan kung paano po yung proseso, i-impound kami and we will be charged 5,000 pesos. Ang dugo naman! Yes po, ang nangyayari po yun. At uh, ngayon po, eh, kahit wala kang initial violation na dumadaan ng truck sa kalsada, paparahin ka just, just to check yung mga dokumento na hawak-hawak mo. And that's illegal. Dapat po kasi sa mga traffic, sa mga sasakyan, you have to have an initial violation or moving violation for that matter or visible administrative violation before you can plug down a truck or a driver Para po doon ngayon po, hindi, paparahin ka lang, ahanapan ka na kung ano-anong dokumento at kapag ka hindi mo na-presenta, that's the time he impound ka uh, for 5,000 pesos na impounding. Nangyayari po ito sa mga LGUs. Ang isa pa po na, na napakalaking problema namin, ito po mga LGUs by sarili-sarili pong uh, mga traffic uh, code sa kanila. And uh, ganun din po, nag issue sila ng uh, ordinance violation receipts in their respective LGUs na doon lang po ang effectivity. Kapag ikaw ay na-issuehan po ng, uh, ng uh, ticket, the OVR, say in Cavite or in Bulacan, yes. at umuwas ka ng Manila at nahuli ka ng traffic enforcer ng Metro Manila cities, Ang, ang uh, kanila po kagad, it's driving without license. Kasi yung pong ticket na, na, na issue sa'yo ng probinsya ay hindi nila in-honor. Dito sa Manila, vice versa. Pag na-issuean ka ng mga ticket ng Manila, Ganon hindi din. nila in-honor. And you will be impounded. Kasi uh, impoundable offense po yung driving without license. So penalty okay. plus impounding, uh, impounding fee. Eh, ang effect po nito na isang nakikita namin what if ma-aksidente yung truck tapos ang initial violation bukod sa aksidente driving without license ang, 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 ang confusion po dito is how will it affect yung insurance coverage mo okay. para po sa yung so yun po yung isa na gusto pa rin namin ilapit sa inyo na, na ma-address itong uh, problema and um, uh, ito po yung apekto nung ano eh, ito po yung apekto nung uh, local government code na nag uh, encroach po doon sa ating national policies ng uh, ng uh, RE 4136 na ma-address po sana kasi dati po talagang ang biyahe ng truck ay confined ka lang doon sa isang probinsya o sa isang municipality but nowadays because of the nautical highway because of the infrastructure talagang all over the Philippines ay nakakarating na po tayo. Kaya po, yun na po yung nangyayari. And uh, yung pong RA 4136 eh, talagang medyo matanda na rin. Matanda pa po sa akin. No? <laughs> po, baka nga po, baka nga po, mas nauna pa sa inyo yun. Kaya po ganun. And uh, lastly, lastly po, uh, Madam Chaya, no? uh, for the last uh, 14 months or more, simula nung nadeklara yung pandemic, and um, kami ay nabigyan ng pagkakataon ng uh, unhampered movement of goods. Kami po ay continuously umiikot. Nagde-deliver ng ating mga produkto, nagde-deliver ng ating mga gamot, nagde-deliver ng mga pagkain. And um, for us, uh, we are frontliners. 
No, we are the movers of the economy. We are the frontliners para sa ekonomiya. And and uh, and yet, and yet, I uh, wait, what happened? Bebe. Alas, si Mr. Yeah. Erbaso nag-disappear. Teka. Sandali lang po. Sandali lang po. Ay, 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 ay. And yet, and yet, no po, um, uh, simula po nung Warsaw ng 2020, uh, sabi ko eh, ang daladala lang po namin ay face mask na disposable at face mask na, na washable, isang boteng alcohol, and uh, yung po aming face shield ay hindi naman namin pwedeng gamitin habang nagdadrive kasi hindi po namin makikita yung kalsada, baka po maaksidente kami. Kaya po kami ay lumalapit sa inyo na masama po kami doon sa priority ng access on the vaccines. Uh, hindi lang po kami makapagpresenta ng, uh, ng uh, datos on how many from our uh, uh, ranks ang naapektuhan, na-infect, gumaling. But uh, yung mga operators, meron na rin po kami na, well, na, na biktima, no? Uh, just last month, meron po kami isang operator na yung husband niya ay namatay ng Wednesday, yung wife niya namatay ng Friday because of the COVID. So much more pa po yung aming mga drivers and helpers and uh, other frontliners na gumagalaw. Kaya po sana, we would like to take this opportunity in behalf of all the trackers and the other transport group na kami po ay masama doon sa priority ng uh, ng vaccination. Wala pinagpilitan uh, namin at nag-announce na sila kapag uh, kinakapos sila sa A1, A2, A3. Yung ating essential workers katulad ng truckers ay uh, ma-vaccinate na. So kasama na kayo doon sa priority listing. Um, yes, Ang problema sa kung sa saan yung vaccine, kung uh, yes, sa yes, yung supply... Yes. Yun po yung sasabihin ko ngayon. No? Ang sa akin po, sa amin po, ay kung pwede po kaming mag-volunteer uh, mag ng aming vaccination facility or area base sa approval kung sino po yung magbabaksin sa amin. Okay. And uh, from there, talaga pong, kung meron na kaming pila, it's purely uh, transport uh, uh, manpowers no? from drivers to dispatchers uh, para po mas mapabilis namin yung aming... Uh, yung aming vaccination and uh, we're willing to coordinate kung sino man pong government agency okay. pwede namin lapitan at may presenta po itong aming suggestion or proposal. I'm you know, Ayusya. Thank you very much Mr. Yes, Epinasio. Sabihin ko sa sa Secretary Galvez at yung iba pa na nagpo-volunteer kayo kahit kayo-kayo na sariling sikap na yung vaccination. Maraming yes, salamat. Basta po free yung vaccine. Sige, thank you very much. Ang sitap, andyan naman si Mary. Nako Mary, sa kilometro ang inyong uh, position paper. Uh, Miss Mary Sapata. Ay, magandang hapon, Madam Senator. Yes po, yes po. We will do it lang. Yes, magandang hapon, uh, Mary, and welcome to our committee. Uh, natanggap namin yung inyong mga uh, position paper tungkol sa uh, tabs, tungkol sa track ban, number coding, LGU pass-through, at uh, kung ano-ano pa. So, uh, alin dito ang pinakamahalaga? Uh, dalawa lang yung gusto namin i-highlight sa inyo, um, uh, Madam Senator. Yun lang implementation ng TABS. Uh, ang agency lang dito involved ay TPA. Yes. At saka, yes. At saka yung sa shipping line. Alam niyo ba yung TABS, uh, monthly yan, it's two, more or less 200 billion pesos involved. At yan, ah, additional po. Ah, ganyan pa Opo. Yan po ay additional cost on the trackers and the broker and the importer. Yun namang isa na sinabi ko sa inyo, kaya shipping, uh, PPA lang, Yung kasing PPA, nagkaroon ng creation ng isang office na SPO na siyang nagmo-monitor ng mga uh, aming concern with the shipping companies. Alam mo ba yung, alam niyo po ba yung gastos namin ng return lang, yung sa uli ng MT, nung equipo lang ng shipping line, 
that is more or less 195 million a month. At yung aming container deposit, yes, at yung aming container deposit na inilalagay sa kanila on a monthly basis, it's more or less 1 billion 300 uh, million pesos. So Hindi ito po ay... Bansa? Hindi ba sa ibang bansa, uh, some of those costs are absorbed by the shipping lines? Di ba sila ang, responsibility, ang responsable dyan? Dapat sana dahil ito equip po nila. But okay. then, I, 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 ipinapas on nga nila sa amin na ito ay result ng mga inefficient operation system ng mga shipping line. Yung container deposit naman, ang worry namin dito, uh, Madam Senator, is that Napalak, napakalaki ng amount involved at mayroon na kaming history in the shipping industry na nagsara sila tapos yung aming mga container deposit no way na kami na ma-recover so yun yung takot namin kaya ito talagang kung hinihingi namin sa inyo tulungan nyo kami with PPA to revisit yung implementation ng TABS at saka yung processes being undertaken by the shipping company. Dahil itong perang itong napakalaki, ay ito ay kung mababawasan, kung hindi man mawala totally, napakalaking relief on the trucker side. I see, I see. Hindi ba napakatagal na ng mga reklamo tungkol sa TABS? Hindi pa ba naa-action na ng PPA at saka ng DOTR yan? Pagkatagal-tagal na kang naririnig yung mga daing na yan eh. Wala pa po kami nakikitang relief at uh, although ang DTI through the effort ni Secretary Lopez at saka ni Asik Jean Pacheco, yes. talagang nagpipilit silang tulungan kami pero uh, hanggang ngayon wala pa kami nakukuhang linaw dahil in the absence of a government office who will regulate the operation or who will be regulating the hmm operation of the shipping lines dito sa atin sa Pilipinas. Kaya... Ang regulation, ito, hindi ba PPA yan? Or at least DOTR? Lately, yung DOTR created a special uh, protection office. Uh, ang nag implement po noon ay PPA. Pero for the longest time na nangyari yun, na create yun, at nakakaroon naman ng mga hearing-hearing pero uh -oh. ang tingin natin parang wala rin lang dahil parang recommendatory pa rin lang yung kanilang whatever kung magiging resulta ng mga investigations. So uh -huh. kaya ito ang apila namin sa inyo since ang PPA naman ay government office baka yeah. call nyo nyo yung attention nila to sit down or, or to have these things really uh, pag-usapan seriously at napakalaki pong pera ang involved at ito po ay mayroon naman pong nakikinabang dito pero po ito ay medyo problema at misery ng mga tracker, broker at importer. Thank you, thank you. At uh, dagdag presyo para sa consumer, di ba? Kasi syempre, papaso on naman yan. Yes, oh, talagang ano to, uh, kung mawawala ito, imagine mo, say yung tabs lang implementation, more or less 200 million a month. Malaking Pero relief yan. yan Opo. Tapos yun lang sa shipping line na yung certain return of empty expense lang on the part of the tracker, 195 million yan. Yung container deposit na perang natutulog doon namin sa kanila, is 1 billion 300 a month more or less. So imagine nyo kung itong perang ito gagamitin namin to expand or to to sustain our operation. Magiging magaan para sa amin ito. Yeah, malaking bagay, lalaki pala ng pera involved. Malaki po ito, malaking uh, pera at ito nga ito yung mga sinasabi nga namin na uh, these amounts are Misery for the tracker and the broker, but a fortune to others. 
Okay, so uh, ang gagawin ko immediately, gag matatawag tayo ng, uh, uh, file tayo ng resolution to investigate um, the uh, implementation of the tax. The Senate of Precise Function. Tapos ikalawa, pag-aralan natin, sana tulungan ninyo kami kung ano nga ang dapat uh, mangyari sa regulation ng shipping lines kasi hindi naman maaari na isang malaking sektor eh hindi regulated ng ating pamahalaan. Okay. Maraming pumapalaktak dito, Madam Senator. Ay, ano eh, parang, parang may nasabi yata akong tama. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, may I? Yes, please. Uh, just, uh, yes, Peter. Ayan, just Peter, Peter Akila, baka... Baka yung shipping gustong uh, mag-react at uh, kontrabida yata kayo. Uh, Ma'am, uh, gusto ko lang i-clarify yung point ni uh, Mary. Uh, yes. Yung kung mga sinasabi niya, mga charges niya, charges po yun ng foreign shipping lines. Yes, wala correct. Charges, wala, wala pong charges ang domestic shipping lines sa ganyan. <laughs> okay. Yun lang po muna. Mamaya ako yung mag-represent ng uh, side ng shipping. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, marami pa kayong suggestion, Mary, dito sa sinabit niyo sa komite at uh, susuriin namin maigi kung alin ang pwedeng aksyonan kagad o yung iba, ipakipakin na lang natin, baka sakali makachamba, yung iba, i-file na lang natin. Yung iba, nahihingi ng budget uh, pagdating ng Sep August, September, eh... Talagang sabihan natin na wala kayong budget pag hindi kayo nagpe-perform. Problema yung PPA, government corporation yan, wala sa budget. Pero yung DOTR na rin naman. So, tignan natin kung ano. Madam Senator, aasahan namin yung iyong binditiwang mga salita at uh, uh, ngayon pa lang masaya na kami at nagpapasalamat. si uh, Comsec Beth. Sino ito matatawag natin? Maraming salamat, si Mary. Nand Opa. Nandito po si Atty. Maniebo. Okay. May dadagdag po kayo sa tropa ng hataw. Opo, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, yes actually, uh, many of the points that uh, uh, our colleagues raised from the other associations are very valid and there actually are concerns too. Um, we just like to add, uh, yes. yes, definitely our, our um, truckers, truck operators and drivers have been uh, very much hit by this pandemic. Uh, more than 30 or 40 percent have lost uh, their jobs or, or their businesses. Um, so, sa ngayon, uh, actually, it's mostly the truckers that are taking the brunt of uh, giving assistance to those drivers. Eh. So maybe we could ask uh, the government for further assistance to, to those drivers na nang walang mga trabaho and mga helpers. No, na umuwi na sa kanila uh, mga probinsya dahil wala na silang trabaho dito sa, sa Manila or uh, sa, sa kumpanya nila. Um, with the, uh, uh, some of the problems actually that we faced, they were already there prior to the pandemic as was pointed earlier. Uh, however, they became exacerbated, no, na-aggravate na sila during the pandemic. Uh, such as yung sa LTFRB, yung pag-process po ng uh, franchise, which until now po, despite the fact na uh, there's a contraction in the uh, number of applications for franchises, eh, um, it still takes more than one year or two years uh, in some cases before franchises are, are heard and approved. Um, again, uh, also yung mga provisional authority na in-issue, uh, nag expire po sila. Uh, within 90 days uh, and hindi na act upon yung, yung main franchise application and the truckers are left um, uh, without a franchise or a provisional authority. Uh, yeah. Can uh, you hear me, uh, Attorney yes. Maniebo? Can you hear I me? I can hear you now. About... Yeah. Uh, why one to two years following application? Ang <laughs> naman nun. Why daw? Bakit <laughs> was the real reason? 
Uh, I think, well, they have mentioned that uh, it has to do with the sheer volume of uh, applications. Eh, but you uh, said nga may 40% decline na in demand and employment. Eh, that means they're only on 60% capacity. Dapat mabilis na mabilis na yan. Well, that should be the case. Um, also, kasi si LTFRB, they not only regulate mga truck operators, but they also regulate um, mga transport um, uh, transport of persons now uh so mga jeeps buses and so on so oh, all of that uh, they're here of the applications so it could be possibly uh, yun, the, the share volume of uh, the applications pero still uh yun oh. nga, there's a decline it should be more efficient now correct i see yeah. i see um uh -oh. these applications are with ltfrb yes ltfrb they're uh okay. certificate of public convenience cpc right. and uh the other problem with that is that if it takes that long, uh, you cannot use the trucks in the meantime. So yes. that one year or two years, uh, if you do use it, colorum yan, and you can you can be issued a fine or ticket um, of two hundred thousand in the case of trucks. Uh, so to matakbupo yung oras na meron tayong let's say loan uh, from a bank, tayo at hindi natin magamit yung truck. Uh, it, earlier it was mentioned nga that uh, there was a modernization program. And, uh, opo, so what happened was a lot of uh, truck operators um, acquired new trucks. And of course, there's bank financing for that. But now they're unable to use it because of the delay in uh, processing the, the franchise. No? And um, uh, there was also a law, yung Bayanihan Act, uh, that, yes. you know, um, that uh, granted loan uh, extension. Loan extension, yeah. Correct. Pero... Baka naman po pwede. I, I don't know if it's something that we can do, but uh, it simply is not enough. Eh? Kasi, syempre, it's just a loan extension or payment extension. At some point, uh, it has to be paid on top of the existing or the, the new amortization. So, parang yung problema, uh, ano lang eh, you, you just defer the problem, but later on, we still have to face it. And despite the fact na wala na kaming biyahe, um so we're so are you saying are, that you want are you saying you want a further extension because like you said you. you're just kicking the can down the road yes that's correct uh further extension or quite possibly uh perhaps a, a waiver of the interest uh by by the banks no? or may, i think interest hindi nila kakayanin yung yung hinihingi namin lagi yung surcharges and penalties penalties so so possibly that uh i mean if that's possible Yon, uh, that would uh, grant some relief to truck operators, although many of them have lost uh, yun nga, na ilan na yung mga trucks nila, they foreclosed on their uh, chattel mortgages, and uh, sadly, uh, yun, wala na yung mga trucks nila, and yung mga drivers, obviously, they don't have any means of uh, livelihood na. Grabe, uh, ang hirap pa, no? So, napakahirap po, uh, and on top of that, uh, nabanggit din yung uh, traffic regulations. Uh, what we would want, I think, at this time is, Parang we should take this opportunity to review yung mga traffic regulations natin and enforcement on the roads. Kasi, um, yun nga, the volume is down. So perhaps this is the time that we can uh, review them to make them more efficient. Yeah, so that's that a good when point. When yeah. does pick up, uh, we will have more rationalized regulations and rules and implementation. Cause, because as it is right now, yun nga, iba't ibang regulations ang mga different LGUs. Eh, and then they're manner of implementation is very different as well. Um, perhaps what they should have in mind is more uh, fo a focus on traffic management as opposed to uh, enforcement of violations, no? which opens up uh, the door to sa, sa, sa kotong. Na. Um, uh, so perhaps what they should do is, is yeah, focus on traffic management, uh, not so much on, on the violations itself, um, yeah, yeah. Because there's so many instances, uh, yun nga, impounding uh, local governments. Impounding, katakot-takot pala. Tapos yung mga yung mga deposits that are never refunded. Correct. This is okay. awful. And, and obviously, they would hold your trucks hostage unless you release it. And if my carga yung truck, you're compelled to okay. pay whatever it is that they demand you to pay. So the same thing with uh, the shipping line and, and the port. Uh, these surcharges or additional charges imposed by the international shipping lines, uh, really they're in the form of an, uh, 
you're forced you're compelled to pay them otherwise you cannot get your cargo so uh, really they're in the form of hostaging your cargo no? and uh, we're compelled to pay them and of course as uh, brokers or importers truckers these are sadly of course uh, imposed on and and what happens is we just uh, add them on to our rates no? so in the end of course the burden is uh, shouldered by the consumers ultimately no so, so, mm-hmm. so we have uh, very many concerns and sana yun nga, at this time we, we can uh, take I'm this not time certain that, uh, I'm not certain that this was the uh, paper submitted it came from uh, Mary we did not um, submit if, a paper but uh, we yeah, to okay. a chair. Um, if that's the case if you would like to uh, submit something so that uh, it can be included in uh, the minutes and the hearing and the committee report eventually attorney Manya will uh, be happy to receive it if not uh, the points that you've raised are well taken and you can add to them at any point in time thank you very much madam chair yes salamat and i like your first name Ah, thank you. I do too. <laughs> yes. Uh, by the way, uh, please send my regards to Attorney uh, Mike. He was a batchmate and classmate of mine in law school. Oh, okay. So you went to the right school too. Thank you. I did. <laughs> well done. Okay. Um, uh, narito pa, Beth, si uh, Kuan, Mr. Magtalas. Yes, Senator. Nakalagin pa po si, si Mr. John Magtalas. Okay, ako'y, uh, ako'y mag, uh, mag uh, for five second break lang, ha? Uh, and uh, please get ready, Mr. Magtalas and then Attorney Peter. Salamat. Uh, Beth, Comsec Senator, Beth. I you... think wala na po si Mr. John Magtala, so we proceed okay, na po sa last na okay. shipping na po. Okay, thank you. Apo. Uh, and then na po si Attorney Peter Aguilar, Executive Director Marco. ng Philippine Inter-Island Shipping. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, but, uh, just... Are you going to present or Mark? Uh, it's Mark, but I'm go- I'm just uh, going to introduce briefly uh, the Philippine Inter-Island Shipping Association okay. uh, so that uh, all the participants may know what PISA is. Uh, PISA uh, stands for Philippine Inter-Island Shipping Association. It's the umbrella organization of the various stakeholders in the domestic shipping industry. We have with us uh, uh, the major, major players in the... Uh, Domestic uh, shipping, uh, both uh, from 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 the Roro, from the tugboat of operators. We have two uh, major operators uh, of uh, Harbor Tag, Harbor Star Shipping, and Malayan Towing, we, and we also have the uh, various uh, uh, big operators in the liner sector, uh, carrying passengers and cargo like uh, to go, 
uh, magtreten group of shipping, churches, logistics, etc. Uh, from uh, with uh, among our members also are uh, business related shipping uh, companies uh, as associate members, including yung mga uh, mga classification societies and uh, PNI. Uh, with respect to with respect to the situation the, of the domestic shipping industry and uh, 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 the effect of the pandemic uh, on on uh, domestic shipping, I will uh, defer to my colleague, Mr. Uh, uh, Mark Paco. He is the president of the Philippine Liner Shipping Association. The Philippine uh, Liner Shipping Association is the uh, association affiliated with PISA. Uh, which uh, operates uh, ships that have uh, that have fixed routes. Uh, I see. So, Mark, you can you can now uh, the table is yours now, Mark. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, senators. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, uh, just just on the impact of COVID. Uh, for 2020, there was a 17 percent full year reduction in volumes. This really hit uh, uh, shipping because, as you know, we are Sorry, capital. Was that 17, 17, 17? 17. Okay. Yes, 17%. Uh, as you know, we are a capital intensive business and uh, we need to have the volume to be able to be able to recover our cost. And the 17% drop really hit us. And again, if you look at April, it was as much as 64% drop. So... Uh, the lines were suffering at this time and the, the other thing that helped us get through that was the the fuel did decrease during the time uh at the height of covid but now it's going up again and uh if uh, we do submit regularly our our financials to marina who is regulating the domestic shipping industry uh and uh in average we were uh, the lines were losing money in in 2018 it was around 1.8 billion of losses uh, it's it's a combination of uh, additional tonnage and a lot of competition in the in the business as well as the increasing cost. So anyway, uh, moving further, uh, I think we were invited also here to to talk about uh, domestic shipping and uh, some people uh, were saying that our costs were very high, our charges were very high, and I'd like to thank Attorney Manyebo for clearly delineating between international and domestic in his speech. And um, Mary, uh, thank you for your talk. But uh, in the future, we, we really request when you talk about uh, charges, you have to be clear whether it's domestic or international. Anyway, moving forward, domestic shipping, we carry 90% of the inter-island trade. Uh, we go even during disasters. Uh, uh, in Leyte, we, we did go there in Tacloban. Uh, pandemics, economic downturns, we continue to serve the country. Shipping is a key part of the logistics chain. Uh, because we're an archipelago, uh, whether you say it's trucked, it has to move by a ship to get it to the other island. Uh, the first myth really is that domestic shipping is a culprit of high transportation cost. The other myth is, of course, domestic shipping is more expensive than international shipping uh, in the Philippines. But uh, let, we'll tackle it one by one. So. First is the domestic shipping is a culprit of high transportation costs. But honestly, shipping is a small portion of the total transportation costs. And I will I will just go to two agricultural products. Uh, one is Lakatan. If, if you look at Lakatan, this is from uh, Cagayan de Oro to Manila. And I've taken the PSA prices uh, December 2020 for Farmgate and January 2021 for NCR Retail. And uh, I know the rates have not increased because, in fact, we were asked to reduce rates. So if you look at the farm gate price, it was 28 pesos per kilo, 29. Uh, the shipping cost is, when we look at the cost and uh, divide it by kilo, it's 3 pesos per kilo. But in Metro Manila, it's sold at 70.46. So we cannot really say that shipping is the main driver of uh, any high cost. Now, what's a very hot commodity? Live hogs. This is from Jensan to Metro Manila. Again, PSA... Uh, prices December 2020 on the per kilo farm gate price in Sox was 119 pesos 120 call it 120 retail price in Manila in January was 331 down from the high of the 400 our shipping cost did not change the whole time it was six pesos per kilo because we carry 80 hogs 200 kilos each in one container 
So dividing it by uh, the cost is around 95,000, it goes down to six pesos per kilo. So again, we do not add to the high cost of anything. It is a very affordable price. Now, how do we lower uh, shipping costs? Now, in it, it's lucky we're talking about corn. Corn, the Philippines is shipped in a container, 20 metric tons, uh, and it's put in, in bags. Whereas internationally, it's shipped in bulk in 60,000 metric tons per vessel with very little uh, labor involved. So if, if you really go, it's really standards. It's really, uh, it's really scale. The greater the scale, the lower the cost. Uh, one thing we were talking is uh, we have to add value to the shipments. Uh, if, you, if you ship raw materials, then of course the value is low and the cost, the percentage of shipping to that will be much higher. But if you do, uh, in this case, for hogs uh, and corn and feed mill, in, in the old days, uh, corn would be shipped to Manila to the feed mill, and then from the feed mill, it would be shipped back to the provinces, to the hog and poultry growing areas, and then the hog will be shipped back to Manila. Why should that be the case? Why doesn't everything happen at source? And then you ship the, the, the hogs, not live, but in fact, if you, if you box it, it's much, uh, it's, it's better. I mean, internationally, we do not uh, import hogs live. We import hogs frozen because that is the safest, cleanest way to move cargo. So anyway, uh, the other myth is domestic shipping is more expensive than international shipping. I always get asked this question, how can international shipping afford, give me a $1 freight rate uh, from, in this case, Kaohsiung to Manila, and then you are charging me 20 to 23,000 pesos freight from uh, Manila to Cebu. So you think, how does that happen? Well, let me show you. It's very different. This is the Kaohsiung rate. It's $1. Then they have an origin fee of one eight, an origin fee THC of 5,600, a Manila dock fee of 50, container imbalance fee of 350, Manila THC, peak season surcharge, you add it all up, it's 44,959. In Manila, in the Philippine, in domestic shipping, we charge 23,000 or 20 to 23. I'll use 23. Uh, it, it varies because uh, domestic shipping is uh, uh, deregulated. So the, the different lines can charge different rates. Uh, Arastre, Manila, Arastre Cebu, Warfage Cebu and Cranage are all PPA charges. That's not the lines control. In fact, if you want to charge it direct to PPA, that can be, that can be done. So we only get the freight. It adds up to 27,512. So we are very much uh, lower, but in line. Okay, uh, I, I agree that international shipping has other, uh, other cost items which we may not have, and we may have cost items which are different, but it's in line. Uh, to expect that a shipment will move for $1 only is, is really uh, unreasonable because just bring down a box in the port is going to cost you more than $1. And the cost of a ship is very much more than that $1. So the only difference between us is theirs is broken down where our, ours is more of an all-in. Everything's inside. So shipping follows trade. So the economies of scale is important. If there's a lot of volume, then our ships will be bigger. The ships will be bigger, our unit cost goes down. But domestic ships are small because the trade is small. Uh, and, and honestly, it really doesn't matter. Not only the, the trade is small, but also the port facilities are not there to, ma to handle the bigger ships. If I was to bring a big international ship to Zamboanga, it won't happen because Zamboanga does not have cranes. It's not deep enough. There are not enough birds. So it will never happen. We will always put small ships into Zamboanga until that facility or that port is expanded and modernized with new equipment. So again, this condition will be faced by any ship owner, whether it's owned by Filipinos or foreigners. So sometimes opening up and saying uh, cabotage or deregular, uh, uh, allowing foreigners to come in into domestic trade that will not automatically bring down freight because it is the conditions in the market which cause the high freight rate. Now, an example, uh, uh, Again, uh, Philippines in the Philippines, we're a feeder economy, but then the ships that come into to the Philippines that feed cargo for international, around 
are around 2,000 to 3,000 TUs. Then they connect with the mother vessels in 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 Kaohsiung or in China or in Singapore, which are 4,000 to 18,000. But believe me, there's no more 14,000 4,000 ships going to US or going to Europe. They're all around 15 to 20,000 right now. In Manila, in then uh, for corn, Panama ships are around 65,000 metric tons. So the unit cost is very low. In the Philippines. Our small our feeder ships are around 350 to 750, and it doesn't even get full at 750. Roll row ships are 80 to 150, uh, but I know one of our members just brought in a ship which is around 300, but that's around that's a small ship. Uh, that's a, that's only one vessel. Our long haul vessels, which are the Manila to Davao, as an example, is around 400 to 1,000 TUs, and 1,000 is never gets filled up. Uh, Corn from Mindanao to Manila are, when it goes with us, are 20 metric ton lots in a container. So you can imagine the amount of labor, the, the amount of trucking that has to be done for that. Now, we talked about the ports not being, uh, uh, not being up to par. In Manila, there are, I'm just going to talk about container cranes because uh, if uh, this is a, a very big cost to us. Because if there are no cranes in the ports, then every single one of our ship will have to have a crane. If all the ports have cranes, then we can buy ships without cranes and the cost is much lower and the productivity is much faster. In Manila, the domestic port has cranes. Batangas, the domestic port does not have cranes. In Cebu, yes, they have cranes, but uh, not everyone can go under it because uh, they're not enough. There's only three of them. Cagayan de Oro, there are cranes, and again, it's disparate, but uh, not everyone can go under them, again, because of the numbers. Davao has no cranes, Bacolod has no cranes, Iloilo, no cranes, Tacloban, no cranes. Subic has cranes, but nobody goes to Subic because uh, it's all trucked via Manila. Then General Santos, which is another big port, does not have cranes. So, you know, honestly, we have to get out of the tingy uh, trade and consolidate. We have to have bigger uh markets that's the only way to bring down the unit cost uh domestic shipping lines are your partners uh we've been there we'll always be there in fact uh i continue to have discussions with the department of agriculture and dti on the on the uh vegetables out of mindanao and see how we can help them our next meeting is june 2 to see how we can help them but they have to come up with the volumes because if it's too small, the, the cost will be much high. It will be too high. It won't be sustainable. Uh, now, people ask us what we can do or what, what's the problem. DTI already had this uh, study in 2015. And one, was, one problem they said was productivity, inefficient port and terminals. Uh, lower productivity means higher cost. Uh, IFC said the same thing in 2012. And honestly, there's not been much change in the ports. Economies of scale, even DTI said, in the economies of scale and balance of trade is very important because right now uh, the trade is so imbalanced that uh, laden cargo, laden containers go to, to Visayas Mindanao and empty containers come back. So someone has to pay for the empty container. So it's the cargo which moves which pays, which pays for that. So uh, DTI said larger ships, cheaper uh, unit and volume uh, but the ports have to be able to 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 service them and then uh well dti was they are behind in clustering they have to, to cluster industries so that industries go grow in these areas and the volumes will grow uh well something that's also uh, local lines is taxes paid by domestic and foreign are very different uh, foreign lines only pay 3% common carrier tax, while domestic lines pay 12% on VAT, as well as regular income tax. So anyway, that's, uh, oh, that's a study that's there. That's huge. That's massive. Yes. It's, so when, when people complain and say, is it different? Well, we're already different. Uh, in fact, in, in fuel, we continue to be taxed on the fuel. And again, there's another tax coming up on, on the tankers, an excise tax on the tankers, which is coming up. And that puts us again, everyone at a disadvantage. So our 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 uh, maybe have, our maybe have is, your recommendations in the event that we uh, yes. we can uh, submit them as amendments or perhaps even suggestions for uh, rules and regulations. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, we, we will be very happy to work with you on that. If, honestly, to, Im to reduce logistics costs in the Philippines, we have to improve efficiency. Efficiency has to improve. Port infrastructure has to be efficient. It has the higher productivity. You ask any shipping line, higher productivity, you lower cost, and you get uh, and you, you're able to pass that on to the customers. If there's not enough cranes, there's not enough berthing areas in some ports uh, or even storage areas for containers. In some ports in the south, we are instructed by PPA, you have to remove the containers to the port because we do not have space in the port. Space. So instead of the customers picking it up in the port, we have to move that box to a, a facility outside, a CY, and then the customers have to pick it up there. Just imagine, we have to do all this double handling because there's not enough facilities. The other thing is, of course, regulatory efficiency. Well, I, I'll, I'll just come up with a few, but one is overweight containers. Honestly, uh, you go to North Harbor, you see the the, the 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 roads always get destroyed because the containers are overweight. And not only that, if the if the containers are overweight, it can break the cranes. It, and it's it's a safety problem. In the U.S., they're very well, strict about It breaks about everything. Overweight. It breaks the port. It breaks the roads. It breaks everything. Yes. And it's a safety issue because the brakes will not work as well if it's overweight. Yeah. The other thing, of course, we have we have issues now on pilotage, but that's that's a small thing. The, but the other thing is really annoying, and it's like tree planting. I think the, the truckers would know this. For us to get now a, a permit to do business in a port, we have to plant ten thousand trees for every single permit that we need to ask. So, <laughs> you know, it's just that. Uh, Shipping seems to be uh, being asked to take on all this. Now, we don't see this being asked from uh, uh, the aviation or any it other industry. It sounded good. It sounded good when you were going to be tree planting. But how often do you have to go for a permit? Yeah. Every year. And in fact, for some of our port operators, and they have not differentiated between a big operator and a small operator, you have to plant 500,000 trees to get a permit. And any honestly, permit and the permit is annual annual uh different yeah, kinds yeah. of uh, permits for for some lines for some entities it's 10000 for the big for the ports if you're a port operator it's 500000 and some of them are small port operators and honestly in the public hearing we talked to them in the north said uh, one of the uh, operators said oh they've been planting since 2013 and so far they've planted 10000 so we're saying, how did you come up with 500,000 or 10,000? And what's the additional cost to all of us? And we were not even talking about, in fact, it's supposed to be mangrove. If we do mangrove, we're going to run out of places to plant. <laughs> yes. So anyway, we, we push it back to them. But these are the kind of regulatory, uh, uh, that's the kind of regulatory regime that we are in. Uh, another thing is, of course, to improve cost, although I, I know this is a long shot, but if you go to uh, similarly similarly situated countries, Indonesia and Japan, uh, Indonesia is the largest archipelago, Japan is probably the third after us, they give subsidies because they know the ships are important. Indonesia, it's a fuel subsidy. In Japan, it's a capital subsidy. Ships made in Japan are subsidized so that you know, they can serve uh, the, the, the domestic market. And of course, the last is we have to increase scale by clustering economic zones, which uh, yeah. we've been we've been uh, which is the only way to to one uh, reduce the trade imbalance. So if you if more things are created in the south, then the the, the containers move on a round trip laden basis. So, but if it moves on a one way, then you have to pay for that. Someone has to yeah, pay for the we've been, we've been campaigning for more economic zones, but until now. Uh... Not a single one has been approved, unfortunately, as this not perceived as increased trade or more employment or investment. It's simply perceived as uh, the diminishing tax revenue. Uh, but it, 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 there's really, if, if done properly and in the right places, uh, uh, it will increase employment and uh, it will reduce logistics costs, which will make us more competitive. This is what Indonesia is. I mean, you go, you go to Semarang, you go to Panjang, Palembang, which are out ports out there, but in out there, have, uh, economic zones, and they have containers. They have, uh, uh, in fact, they are so good at it that international ships go direct to to these small ports and bring it direct to Singapore, because they have enough volume to do this. 
but I cannot imagine an international ship going to Tacloban. Right now, they only go to uh, Cebu, Cagayan de Oro, Davao, Jensan. Zamboanga, they want to go in, but there's no facility. They cannot go in. They, the ships will suffer tremendous uh, delays. So the, a lot of the international lines don't want to, but there is some cargo. There is the, the, the uh, canned seafood which can move out of there. So this is, this is yeah, only our request. The, it's, it's, it's only it's a, the thin sardines and so on that can go out, no? Yes, but you can build on that. At least if, uh, if the ships can come and if build other industries which are other uh, products which can be exported, you already have the ship. Right now, if you start something in Zamboanga, you have to take it to Manila. Then from Manila goes to Kaohsiung. So there's that extra leg that you have to pay for instead of Zamboanga direct to, uh, to, the, to the markets. So uh, this, this is basically our, it, it's all long term. And uh, unfortunately, there's no quick fix in shipping. And, uh, you know, we, we, we really hope that people understand that uh, domestic shipping is, is affordable. It's not cheap because uh, the cost of ships, the cost of fuel is, is, uh, is expensive, but it's also not that expensive. It is affordable. It's economical. Thank you. Um, I would differ. Uh, the issues about regulatory are uh, actually quick fixes because they're in the power of government. <laughs> Uh, the development yes. of infrastructure is medium term more than long term because yun nga, some of the ports naman pwede na eh, dadagdagan mo na lang eh, so that can be done if we're really committed within three years. So pasok pa rin yun. So uh, I think uh, we could do these things if, uh, like you said, we were committed to them. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. To, uh, to our uh, shipping uh, group, uh, Mark Parco, Attorney Peter Aguilar. Thanks, Thank thanks. You. Thank we, you. Uh, we hear you. And if you'd like to submit any position papers or any other further uh, recommendations, we'd be glad to uh, listen. Thank you. And uh, we hope we can Thank take you. action as soon as possible. So Marina, Marina is your regulatory agency. That's yes. That's Marina cool. and PPA are the ones who we have. Uh, we deal a lot with. Unfortunately, right. sometimes Marina and PPA also don't see eye to eye. So Ayun nga eh. that's oh. why that that's happened on more than one occasion. I uh, I'm actually quite familiar. Okay, sige. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Comsec Beth, is there anyone else who? Pano tosha na po yung last natin. Wala na po. Okay, maraming salamat. E paano yung mga agri na sinasendo and everybody na nahilo-hilo yata sa gutom? Senator, hihingan ko na lang po sila ng individual comments nila at position That's right. paper. I think uh, ang kinakailangan natin na uh, agapan kasi uh, the rest is actually very thoroughly dealt with in the Committee on Agriculture. Ang concern lang natin yung uh, entire value chain. Uh, kung paano uh, mapapadali ang uh, pagdala ng pagkain sa NCR Plus, sa Cebu at sa Davao. Yung parati ang problema eh, yung, uh, yung pagdala ng pagkain. Kasi kung minsan sa agri, napapako tayo sa agriculture. Ito kasi yung overview, no? kasi economic affairs. So kung maari yun ang itanong mo sa mga hindi nakapagsalita, si Mr. Ian Cabriga, Mr. Gomez, si Sendoso, at pati na rin si Attorney Herschel Magracia, kung maari sila magsalita. Although yung fishing, hindi ba nag-submit ng uh, position paper? Meron ko natanggap eh, yung uh, Alliance of uh, Philippine Fishing Federation. Yes po, yeah. Senator. Pero hindi po okay, siya. Okay, so maraming natin. salamat at nagpapasalamat rin ako sa Banko Sentral na napakahaba ng kanilang report. Okay, thanks very much, Beth. At uh, sa lahat na uh, sumapi sa ating uh, talakayan, maraming maraming salamat. Marami tayong narinig, maraming natutunan, marami din dapat baguhin. Maraming salamat, thank you, and see you. At tuloy-tuloy pa rin, may hearing pa tayo at sana may magagandang balita at ehemplo tayong uh, marinig. Maraming salamat. Bye, Senator. Thank you, Paul. Bye, thank you.